Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Derek Ivey, and I am the Youth Services Coordinator at the Suffolk Cooperative Library System. My colleagues from New York Library Systems and I set out on this adventure to create today's workshop. And what we have discovered is you are all incredible. If you're familiar with Avatar The Last Airbender, you may have noticed I am giving a nod to the baldest Avatar, Aang. With the four elements of fun, creativity, daring, and snacks, we believe you will save the world, or at least create the perfect summer reading program for your teens. Today, library staff members from across the state will have gathered their supplies and are ready to share their findings from some of their most creative, fun, and imaginative teen library programs. From live action Mario Kart to taste test challenges, Franken toys to Taylor Swift parties, there is a whole slew of amazing programming ideas that will be presented to let your patrons know that adventure truly does begin at their library. As we all know, adventure means many different things to many different people. As your hosts, we have decided to choose our own adventures, and we hope that you will too. Take these excellent examples of vivacious ventures as inspiration. If you were to recreate one of these programs at your library, it may not look exactly the same, and that's okay. Make sure to choose the adventure and pack your patrons' parcels with the supplies that fit your community best. Don't be afraid to go off the beaten path. Before getting to the good stuff, I do have some housekeeping to go through. Please take this time right now to change your Zoom name to the name you use to register for today's program for easy attendance taking. That's first and last name, please. One of the easiest ways to do this is to click the three dots on your small Zoom box and click rename. Each system rep will be sending professional development certificates to their own system. Our presenters today will have a 10-minute block for their presentations. We also have some time scheduled for Q&A within each of those blocks. As someone is presenting, feel free to drop your question into the chat. But if you could, please start it with the letter Q so we know to come back to it. For our presenters, when you would like to advance the slide, just say, next slide. For timing purposes, please pay attention to our amazing shark friend, Jack. Let me highlight him for all of you. There he is, uh, who will be holding up the two minute warning sign, seen right there. At one minute, a timer will appear on your screen, letting you know to wrap things up. Please don't panic. We won't shut your camera off if you go over. As a note, we will have breaks throughout our time together. This entire event will also be recorded. The videos will be shared at a later date. Now, grab your water bottle jug, a snack or a cabbage or two, and your flying bison, yip yip, because it is time to hear from our incredible colleagues. Up first is Amy Relier from Niskayuna Branch Library and Woodlawn Branch Library, who will be sharing their tween and teen taste test challenge. Hi guys, can you hear me? Sure can, oh, and the hat and everything. Oh, Wonderful. well, I asked my daughter for a chef hat and she said, I don't have a chef hat, but I have this red panda hat. So that's what I'm wearing. Um, <laughs> so uh, like I said, I'm Amy Relier and this is the teen taste test challenge. I originally hosted this program during the February school break of 2023. I had six teens that registered but I only had five show up. And of those five that showed up, only one of them had registered. So I think we're kind of all used to that. Um, next slide, please. Do I have a next slide? It's missing. Yeah, I apologize. It's oh, no worries. <laughs> for some reason it's not advancing. So I'm going to stop the share and then start it over again. Mine's a little glitchy too, so. And we tested it before we started. Let's try this again. 
Okay. So you can flip to the next one if you can. No. Ooh. Oh, okay. Now, now we went too far. Okay, here we go. Okay. So um, for my program plan, uh, we pick our programs about two months out. And um, so I posted flyers in the teen section, as well as in the kids section, because most of the people that registered were uh, caregivers for their teens. Um, I uh, posted to our Facebook page. And um, we have like this kind of, it's called the chapters. It's a bi-monthly program pack that comes out. And I um, listed the program in there. I did do registration for the program, um, but obviously I took people outside of the registration. I picked three challenges for this program, um, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but you could choose tons, but I only had an hour, so I uh, feasibly decided what I could do on my own. I did have prizes for the event. Um, you know, it came from my prize bucket and the snacks that were left over. And, um, my evaluation was twofold. So one, um, I had teens that attended come up to me later on a couple weeks later and ask if I was going to do it again. Um, and then my best form of evaluation was all of the um, like gross and weird and oh my God, this smells so bad in the middle of the program. So I figured that was a really great, great way to evaluate. For my troubleshooting, the INS in this instance means allergies. So um, when people registered, I, count, I contacted everyone. We tend to call our um, registrants the day before, or a couple days before to remind them. So when I called, I just asked if they had any allergies. And then when the teens that showed up that didn't register, I just talked to them at the door and luckily no one had any allergies. Um, so if in is allergies, out is illustrated by that pumpkin there. So I did make a few um, of the challenges were a little gross. I told kids if they didn't want to try it, they didn't have to, but everyone tried everything I can, I think, after a little pushing from their friends. Um, I did provide each of the teens with a water bottle and a tall cup so they could spit things out if they wanted to, which did happen a few times. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to wait for answers on this since I have a short amount of time and I and I talk a lot, but um, can a teen taste the difference between different types of pop tarts? Next slide, please. Yes, so I had five teens and four out of the five teens could taste the difference between the three pop tarts, which I thought was crazy. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the first challenge was the taste test. Um, I realized after when I was practicing last night that I didn't include a picture. I made challenge card um, cards for each of the challenges. So this one was the taste test. So we had 10 different snacks. Um, and so we had lines on the card that um, where they could write it down. So I had made blindfolds out of um, some t-shirts and some fleece long enough so they could tie it around their uh, back of their heads. So each kid got, each teen got a blindfold, a bottle of water, a score sheet, and a paper plate. And the paper plate was so I could put down the cup of um, the snack without them having, they could just reach for the plate without them blindly searching around with their, with their blindfolds on. Um, so this is definitely the part that had the most amount of prep for it. I had 10 snacks and I had prepped for 10 teens. So that means I had a hundred cups to make. Um, but it was pretty easy. I just poured it into a bowl and separated it into the cups. And then I had like a kind of black flat holder that I could put things in and take things out. So the teens couldn't see what I was doing. So, um, for each snack, I would ask them to put their blindfold on. And once they were all blindfolded, I would put the food down. Um, I would give them the all clear and then they would taste it. And they weren't allowed to open, take off their blindfold until everyone had eaten the food and I gave them the all clear. 
once they tasted it, they wrote down what they thought it was. And then we repeated the process for all 10 snacks. Um, I tried to choose a variety of snacks, some gummy things, some pop tarts, chips, um, malt balls. I was really surprised that two of the kids knew what malt balls were. Um, and it turns out their grandmother gave it to them. So, uh, they were the only ones that knew what that was. So, um, next slide, please. Okay. Can teens rate the different types of chips on crunchiness, taste, and color alone? Next slide, please. Okay, so no, <laughs> they couldn't do it on that alone because they had to add their own categories. So they added smell, the greasiness of the chip, and the difficulties of opening the bag. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so for this, um, for this challenge, there wasn't any scorecards. It was just basically, there wasn't any point value system. So the last um, challenge, they got a point for each one they got right. So this one was just kind of a rating. Um, I decided to use five different flavors of one brand. So I used the Utz chips. And truthfully, I only did this because it was cheaper to buy a bulk of multi um, chips for one brand and buying a whole slew of other brands. Um, so we rated them with five stars each, one being the worst and fifth being the best. Um, and again, they had a lot of fun saying, you know, which one was crunchy and which one uh, was greasy, which I feel like they tested on the front of their shirt. Any of you guys that have teens see your kids slide across the front of their shirt. Um, they also like, we're talking about how the bags would were difficult to open and we did have a couple um, come out. And so I just put a couple suggestions in there for different ways to do the program. You could do something kind of like a Pepsi challenge and um, you know pit two chips against each other. Or if you wanted to do this program in November when people are voting, it would be a great way to say, I voted today and get your little sticker, even though it was just about um, chips. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I think the question is, because it's covered up on my screens, but I think the question is, can a teen librarian, can a librarian convince a teen to eat this concoction? Next slide, please. So yes, yes, you can. And you guys can't see this right now, but when, when the share comes through, it's actually a little video and you can actually hear the pop rocks popping as they mix with the mashed potatoes. Um, if you <laughs> could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this was the mashup mayhem. I made three different mashups, again, in, in the cups. Um, I did a three ingredient, a four ingredient, and a five ingredient. Um, and the kids had to, the teens had to try and guess what the food was inside. Um, so um, the teens were really grossed out, which again was a bonus and pleased me immensely. Um, so one of the challenges was um, box mashed potatoes, crushed goldfish, maple syrup, cut up Sour Patch Kids, and blue food coloring. Um, and so all the kids tasted it. And some of them are really great. Some of them got it. Um, I think another way that you can do this is if you um, have the teens make the concoctions themselves and to test the other person. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so prizes. Teens got one point for everything that they got right. And then at the end, um, the winner got to choose something for my prize bucket, which, you know, we all have all those crazy prize kicking around. And then everyone else got to choose something from um, the food. And truthfully, the kid that won, he didn't take anything from the prize bucket. He just took extra food. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, so this is my planning time. I really didn't do a whole lot of research because like me, you guys probably have a list of all the programs that you've seen or that you've looked at online. And so I kind of went from there, did a little research. Really the hardest thing was the prepping of the food and the cleanup was super easy. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay. So really, again, the food was the biggest budget. Um, the small cups and the spoons that I used were compostable. So those cost a little bit more. You can get the compostable cups. I think I got 50 for $10 and the spoons I already had on hand. Um, and again, the paper products, it was a really cheap program to do besides the, besides the food budget. Next slide, please. Oh, look, I'm at the end. Um, I wanted to include this picture because when I was searching on my phone for pumpkin pictures, this one came up and this was a couple Nylas ago when my dinosaurs from my library snuck in my luggage so they could experience the true joy of Nyla. So if you saw this like crazy lady taking pictures in the fireplace in the, you know, in the lobby there of where the conference is, that, that was totally me. Um, and that's it. They really do look like they are enjoying the true joy of Nyla. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they had a great time. They hung out with a tattoo artist and they had some food. It was it was a lovely, a lovely adventure for them. That's so fun. Um, Amy, what a fantastic program. Thank you so much for sharing this. I just need to know. So what else was in that mashed potato concoction? OK, so that one. Let me go back to my notes. That one was mashed potatoes. It was like box mashed potatoes crushed yeah. up goldfish, cut up um, like uh, Sour Patch Kids and Pop Rocks and blue food coloring. So when it came out to them, it was, I put the Pop Rocks in just at the end. And so you could hear it bubbling inside. I did a couple other ones with like saltine crackers and um, maple syrup. Um, and then I made them all wacky colors. So good. Well, Amy, thank you so much for sharing this really fun program. This is a perfect thank way you. to kick off our time together today. All right. So up next, we have Amy Darko from Levittown Public Library, who's going to be sharing their Amazing Race Teen Edition. Hello. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so hi, I'm Amy. I'm a teen librarian at the Levittown Public Library. And today I'm sharing my program, Amazing Race Teen Edition. Um, this program is based directly off of the TV show, The Amazing Race, where groups travel across the world and complete challenges in every country they visit. Um, in my program, groups travel to seven countries. They will complete an activity related to the country that they are visiting. They will then receive a clue directing them to their next country. When all the stations are complete, they will complete a flag challenge, and then they will check in at the pit stop, which is the end of the race. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the setup for the program. Um, so for mine, I had teens work in groups of three, which worked really well last year, and I wouldn't recommend going over 18 teams or six groups. Um, similar to the TV show, each group will receive a budget of $200 to use throughout the race. They will use this money to purchase supplies to complete some of their challenges or to purchase a hint if they get stuck somewhere. There will be seven countries for them to visit. Each team is going to start at a different country just to prevent too many teams crowding into one space. At some of the stations, groups will have a choice between the two activities that they want to complete. At some stations, each team member will have to complete the task. For example, when they get to Japan, every person will need to make an origami creation, but at other stations, they will need to do one activity as a team. Um, for example, when they get to France, they'll make one painting as a group. Next slide, please. Each activity has an, ass an assigned point value. The reason for doing this is that I didn't want teens rushing through the stations and I didn't want the team that moves the fastest to automatically be the winner. At the end of every country, after they visited all seven countries, the teams will all complete a flag challenge, which also mimics the final challenge from the TV show. Each station will have the materials for the activity, a sign with the instructions, the flag of the country, and the next clue on it. And my plan, last year I color-coded the teams red, blue, yellow, green, so when they finish their activity, they take their envelope of that color to keep them on the right track. The majority of the stations will be set up in one room, our community room, where they'll just move from table to table. But I'm also setting up stations upstairs in our teen lounge, in our innovation station, and one station outside, depending on the weather, just to give them a chance to move around the building. Next slide, please. The Roaming Gnome is a direct callback from the TV show, if anyone has seen it. 
the teams on the TV show used to have to carry around giant ceramic gnomes for a prize. In my race, the groups are going to randomly select an envelope with a gnome on it, and the envelope will have bonus points, which they'll open at the pit stop. Any money left from their budget will be converted into bonus points at the end of the race. And I will also give them bonus points based on what place they arrived to the pit stop. But again, being first doesn't automatically mean they'll win. Um, and most points at the end of the race wins the whole thing. Next slide, please. This is a sample of the clue envelope that will be on each table. Um, I printed the logo of the Amazing Race onto construction paper and just folded it into an envelope. And the clues themselves I designed in Canva. Next slide, please. And this is the setup of Brazil and Japan. And you can see the envelopes are color coded. So the green team will always take the green envelope going forward. Um, next slide, please. And these are the countries that I ran. Next slide, please. So in France, teams are going to make their own version of Starry Night. They can choose between markers or colored pencils. This is a station where they're going to have to purchase their supplies to decide how they want to complete the activity. Um, as a general rule of thumb with all of my stations, the activity that can be done faster is worth less points and will cost more money. So teams will have to sort of choose what they want to prioritize as they go through the race. Next slide, please. In Japan, every person will have to make an origami creation. They don't have to be the same. One person can do the cat, two people can do the pinwheel, but they must come to the pit stop with three origami creations for their team. Next slide, please. In Mexico, everyone will have to decorate a mask for Day of the Dead. And again, they'll have to come to the pit stop with three of them. Next slide, please. In Greenland, each team will make an igloo structure out of marshmallows. They can choose between jumbo or mini marshmallows. Again, the jumbo one should make it faster to build your igloo, so it'll be more expensive, but cost less. But it'll be more expensive and be worth less points. And I'll have a template for them of how they should do the structure. Next slide, please. In China, each person will make a red paper lantern out of construction paper, and they will have to come to the pit stop with three lanterns. Next slide, please. I think this is my favorite of them. So each group will defeat the Greek gods by hitting a ball through four wickets in a croquet course that we're going to set up in our outdoor space. Um, I tied pictures, cutouts of the gods to each, I think the term is wicket, the little nets they hit the balls through. Um, and this is a station where they only have to complete four to finish the station. But if they want to stick around and earn bonus points, they can go through a course of eight to earn 20 points. Next station, please. Next slide, please. Brazil is our last country. Groups will need to find five words in a word search. They will also have the option to earn bonus points here. If they want to find 10 words, they can earn 20 points. This is a station where they can purchase a hint if they get stuck. The staff member at the station will have the answer key and will point to the first letter of a word if they pay $10 out of their budget for the hint. This was a station where last year I thought they wouldn't have that much trouble with the word search, but they surprisingly had a lot of trouble. So I built in the hint for them here. Next slide, please. So the very last challenge is a flag challenge. And again, this is directly from the TV show. Teams will have to remember all of the countries they travel to and the order in which they visited them. So I will have flags out on the table. There will be some extra ones mixed in to confuse them. And they just have to pick them up, stack them in order, and bring them to me to be checked. Um, and I've built in their budget here enough money that if they need a hint, they can pay $10 to go back to a table and look at the flag that will be on the table and then come back. I have enough so they can go to every single station if they need a hint, if they don't remember. Because I didn't want anyone to be defeated by this challenge at the end. Um, and I do plan at the beginning of the race to give them a challenge, sort of like keep an eye on the flags because they will come back later just so they're not caught completely unaware for this. Um, next slide, please. This is the setup of the flags. So they'll just pick it up off of a stack, put it in order, bring it to me. And there are extra flags thrown in there. Next slide, please. The pit stop is the end of the race. This is where they will bring all of their materials for scoring. Um, part of why I'm having them bring everything to me is so they don't leave a mess in any other parts of the library. That cleanup is easy. Everything is in one space. If they forget something, they have to pay a penalty and go back and get it to make sure we're not leaving a mess. Um, we will also open their gnomes here for bonus points. We'll convert, I'll take their extra money and convert that into points for them. And then I will award points based on first, second, third place. Uh, next stop, next slide, please. 
So I do plan on purchasing an international snack box from Amazon, and I will have that out. So after they check in at the pit stop, they can grab a snack while I total everything up. Once the scores are all counted, we will announce the winner and prizes will be given out. Uh, next slide. Next slide, yes. Okay, so all of the supplies are things I had in-house already. Construction paper, cardstock, Monopoly money, origami paper. Um, all of the signs, the clues, the instructions were designed in Canva. Um, our croquet set is from our library of things, so I'm able to borrow that and set that up for the program. Um, worst case scenario, if it rains too, I can swap it to just cornhole and cover the hole with a Greek god and have them help the bean bags if we have to move inside for that. Um, so the only things that I'm really purchasing for this are the marshmallows and the international snack box. And those weren't terribly expensive. The snack box is the most expensive of the items. In terms of planning, planning didn't take terribly long. It was just choosing what challenges to tie to which countries they would do. Um, taking taking the templates for the clues and making the signs and the instructions and all of that, that took a decent amount of time. I'd say two to three hours for that, but I did that last year. So recycling everything for this year was super easy. It was just printing it out and setting it up. Um, next slide, please. So all of my materials are available here. If anyone wants to run this program, I've got all of the clues, the signs, the instructions for each station and the score sheets and the flags there. And I've also included blank clue cards um, and blank station signs if you want to upload them into Canva and customize them from your building for your building and your space. Um, next slide, please. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please reach out. I'm happy to help. Um, I had a lot of fun doing this program last year. Amy, this looks like so much fun. I love adding the gnomes and the flag challenge. Also, I think the money management would make me very nervous. So that's good for them. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of questions here. Um, so Diana asks, is the $200 fake money? Yes, it's Monopoly money. I actually have the stack of Monopoly money here that I'm portioning out for them. Um, completely fake money. Great. <laughs> only um, right. Imagine. Uh, Casey asks, how many staff members did you need to run this program? So last year, the way I managed to do it is that I had myself in one room managing the majority of the stations. The stations that I put in other places were not ones where a staff member needed to be directly involved. Like making of the masks, mm. a staff member in the room could keep an eye on them to make sure they weren't getting rowdy, but they don't have to actually assist them with anything. Same thing with the lanterns. Um, same thing with the igloos, the food on the floor was another issue, but again, it wasn't something where a staff member had to be directly involved with that. So that's how I was able to spread it out. This year, ideally, I will need an extra staff member to be in that outdoor space to supervise them. Um, yeah. so I would say four people would be ideal. Someone outside, two people in the room with the most stations. And then if you want to put a room, a station in a different room, someone in that room. That makes sense. Um, someone had asked, does this take place uh, all outdoors, but only one of the stations was outdoors, right? Yes. Our community okay. room is also like our theater room. So I'm able to fit five or six tables in there and one station per table. Great. Oh, uh, let's see. How many teens did you get? Last year I had 12 and last year it was actually a shorter program. It was a half hour and we did four stations, but I had 12 teens and four teams of three. That's great. And then someone wants to know, um, did you decide the teens or did the teens decide the teams? I let them choose last year and it happened to work out where they came in groups of three, like they were with friends. So that worked out very nicely. Um, I think this year, if it's not that nicely set up, I will pick the teams for them just to avoid any stress and hurt feelings. Sure, definitely. Um, Amy, thank you again so much for sharing this wonderful program with us. That was so much fun. I think people are going wild about it in the chat. So please go check that out. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just dropping a tiny URL in the chat, I think that would be really helpful as well. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. On to our next presentation, everyone. Let us welcome um, Priscilla Bergren Thomas from Finger Lakes Library System, who is presenting Adventures in Writing at the Library. Alrighty. Hi, Priscilla. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so this is a little bit different because I'm going to do a brief overview of a bunch of different writing programs we've done at the library over the years. 
Um, so could I have the next slide? Um, and, and I have to start by saying, despite being a writer, I got into doing writing programs with teens kind of by accident. I was, uh, we started with writers groups because I was um, looking for adults who wanted to do a writers group. And I had a teen come and say to me, well, what about a teen writers group? And I said to him, bring me five teens who want a writers group and we'll do it. And he arrived the next week with five friends. And so that was our first writing group. And those kids were really self-directed and really into it. And they came to the library tw twice a month for, for a couple of years until they all graduated. And we gave refreshments and a little bit of direction on writing, but they really knew what they wanted to do. Once they had graduated, um, I had a group of uh, junior high students who wanted to do a writer's group. And so um, we did writing every week with them and we gave them prompts and uh, guidelines about, um, uh, you know, character development, uh, plotting and stuff like that. Next slide, please. Um, but although those kids wanted to be at the library all the time, we realized we needed to do some programs that were like shorter time periods for other kids. So we developed four to six week writing workshops that focused on um, a, t a particular genre. So come and write a fantasy story, come and write a historical fiction story. And we would um, give a little bit of information about same things, character, develop, plot, um, and the kids would write their stories. Um, we did do some world building workshops, which were very popular. Um, we got some teachers to come and give a little information about governments and social structures and religions, and then the kids would create their own world. And um, we would give them questions like, what kind of government does it have? How, if it has a king, how is the king picked? Um, if there's a dictator, how did the dictator come into power? If there's a religion, is it, you know, monotheism, polytheism? And they would create the worlds. Um, if it's a fantasy, how does magic work? And they would create the worlds and then they could do whatever they wanted with it. They could create a role-playing game. They could create a story. Um, but the thing we found, next slide, please, is that... Um, showcasing all these stories that were being written was really the important part. And so we would have readings after every workshop at the end of the year, the kids would get together, we'd invite family and friends and they do a reading of their stories. And then we were able to get a grant to actually do printed booklets. So every year we'd put out a printed booklets of all the stories that had been written in that year. Next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit about the booklets. They're like half page, five and a half by eight and a half. We formatted it, them in Word um, and we um, used a local printer. You could do this cheaper online, but using a local printer um, allowed us to like ask for help formatting if it didn't quite work. Um, it's best if it's under 88 pages. You can go over 80 pages. We did a lot that were over 100 pages, but the booklet won't lay flat, that won't close properly. It has to be in a multiple of four. And usually we do a glossy cover on that. Um, and we put out one of these every year for quite a few years. Um, next slide, please. From there, we decided to create a zine. So a zine is a handmade magazine. Um, you, they were originally used for social justice issues. Um, uh, so our zine involved, it allowed us to bring third grade through 12th grade writers together. So it was a cool program in that we had all the kids working together. The teens acted as mentors for the younger kids. They helped with formatting. The group met twice a month. Originally, we published the zine six times a year, but then we moved to quarterly. Um, and we formatted it in publisher. So it was an eight and a half by 11 sheet, four pages long. Um, next slide, please. So um, the kids came up with a name. They named it uh, Tomfoolery, a zine of writers, because tomfoolery is a collective noun for writers. Um, they designed the masthead. 
it consisted mostly of stories, poems, and drawings. Um, we tried occasionally to get them to do like an interview of a visiting author or uh, reporting on something going on in the community. They were not interested in that at all. They really wanted to create stories. Um, we um, picked themes um, for, the, for the zine. Um, and those ran anything from like seasonal, write a winter story, to genres, write a fantasy story, to um, things like kindness and gratitude. Um, and then when we moved to doing it quarterly, it really kind of had that seasonal theme to it. It required a lot of editing of staff. Um, the kids loved writing stories, but they didn't believe in punctuation and uh, capitalization. And so sometimes in order to make it make sense, you know, you had to like sit down and say, okay, what does this mean exactly? What were you trying to say here? Um, they always wanted really crazy fonts, um, but in the end, you know, in order for us to be able to print it and get it to fit, it went to uh, only one font was allowed. We did this in black and white because it was cheaper, um, but you could do it in color also. Uh, next slide. So just some costs, um, the, um, the booklets, um, like I said, uh, 88 pages, multiples of four. Current costs, I checked with the printer last week and it's $8 an issue. Now we were doing real short, small runs of these. We usually were only doing 20 to 25 copies, um, one for each kid involved and um, so it, it, we would get a grant and budget for like $200 a year to pay for a booklet and that that covered it. Uh, the zine is much cheaper. Um, those copies are slightly under 60 cents a copy. And uh, there again, we'd be doing 20 or 25 copies. So if we did it four times a year, uh, we were running right about $50 a year to budget for the zine. Um, we always made a few extra copies of the zine in order to um, have them available for um, patrons of the library if they wanted to read one or pick one up too. Um, next slide. I think that's all I have. Yeah, so um, that's my contact information. Um, and if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Priscilla. This is awesome. I would have loved to have a zine program at my library when I was a teenager. Everyone in the chat loved you saying, okay, if you want to do the writing program, bring me five teens. And then he came back with five. Teens. That is so cool. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of questions. So Diana asks, what is the significance of the dragon? Um, so the kids did a lot of drawing for the zine also. It wasn't just writing. Um, and that was just one of the uh, the um, things they drew when we were doing a fantasy issue. Um, yeah. It's, you got to have a dragon, right? If it's, you have if to it's have fantasy. a dragon. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a favorite saying of ours. Like if you didn't know what was going on um, in your story, you know, just add a dragon. If, if you're stuck, you're scattered <laughs> dragons. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so then let's see, Rio asks, any teens interested in adding their comic into the zine? Um, we did not have a lot of kids who um, were into drawing comics. If they had wanted to, we would have certainly added them. Um, but we that was not the the kids we were working with who were really into drawing comics at all. But they did do a lot of sketches and we did add those to to the zine. Sketches and dragons as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Sarah asked, did you add copies of the publication to your library collection? Um. <laughs> So we did not, <laughs> in retrospect, we really should have. Um, they, you know, they kicked around for a long time. And then when I was retiring, I think they all got tossed out, so. Oh no, yeah. what a bummer. Yeah. How, how many um, zines do you think you ended up publishing? How many issues um, were there? So we probably, I think we were up to, because we it, we would put the edition on it, and I think we were easily up to the 20th edition, 21st, 22nd, yeah. That is very cool. 
Yeah. Priscilla, thank you so much for sharing this fantastic program. Um, and I think that's great advice. When in doubt, add a dragon. So <laughs> we could all use that for our yeah. daily stuff. My thank pleasure. you so much, Priscilla. Yep. All right, folks. So we are at the final presentation for our first hour. So I am going to welcome Laura Ginta from Garden City Public Library, who's gonna be talking about their teen jigsaw puzzle tournament. Uh, so we'll get your presentation up and when you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you. Hi everyone. So um, I'm talking about that our teen jigsaw puzzle tournament. Um, so we've done it twice so far. Um, and um, it's been been going well. So um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that uh, teams work in teams to try to complete a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. Um, when I first had the idea, I did do research on how long it would take. So originally I was like, let's try a thousand. But then when I researched doing a thousand piece puzzle is gonna take much longer. So I settled with 500 um, based on the estimates when I was like looking online, seeing how long it would take, that it would take about a couple hours, particularly, um, you know, they were working with more than one person. Um, each team would consist of three to five players. Um, we had the um, tournament scheduled um, for two hours. Um, so the actual tournament itself was timed for an hour and a half. But I had the program run for two hours um, from six to eight on a weekday evening um, to give time for to go over the rules, to let latecomers arrive, because usually we would have kids would arrive um, five or ten minutes late all the time. And then um, also to give the time for the teens to pick out snacks, because we did have snacks, because usually try to include snacks in all our programs. Um, and and we would also give time at the end for cleanup. Um so at the the idea was then the team who finishes first or had the least amount of pieces left at the end of an hour and a half would win. So um, next slide. So this was applies for 2022. So um, the first, which was the first year we did it. So I got um, six unique 500 piece puzzles. I got them from the same company, which was this one I had picked Buffalo Games. Um, so I. Um, figured so that they would at least be comparable, but I didn't want to get like six of the same exact puzzle because I ended up adding it to our, you know, collection for people to use at the library. Um, the price for each puzzle ranged um, from $8.97 to $12.99. Um, so about $70. Um, that year was the theme, summer theme was Oceans of Possibilities. So you can see they're all um, ocean related. And then um, I got snacks. It was a little hard to figure out exactly how much of the money went towards the, the snacks went towards the jigsaw puzzle tournament um because i usually buy in bulk because i'll have multiple programs during the week um in the next week so i'll be like oh let's just buy a bunch of chips and popcorn or whatever um so some of this from the 4674 was used the week before for team movie night um but generally it was not too too much money um as you can see um, a little over um, 100, I believe. My like slide's a little bit blocked by like the Zoom, but I think it was like 115-ish. So <laughs> next slide. So these are the results for 2022. So we had 12 teams. Um, they participated in three teams. Um, so we had one team that had three, uh, one that had four, one had five. Um, generally, I the, the, the most I would allow would be five on a team because then I feel like you start to get well, one, it would be really hard for everyone to be playing together, you know, like too many cooks in the kitchen. But also then I didn't want them to have such an advantage. Whereas if a team really wanted to have two, let's say, I would, you know, they're putting themselves at a disadvantage, but that's their choice. You know, um, but generally I tried to keep it three to five, which ended up happening. So um, we started after everyone came, we went over the rules and then teens grabbed their stacks. Um, we um, started the tournament around 610. Um, the snacks were also good because sometimes like, you know, it was an hour and a half. So like sometimes if they got a little frustrated, it was like, let's take a snack break, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they were really into it. Um, so no team finished at the hour and a half mark. Um, 
And since we have about 20 minutes at that point, um, I told them they could keep playing. And so after giving a little more time, there was one team that finished by 8 p.m. Um, all the teams really um, enjoyed it and really got into it. So uh, next slide. So um, for 2023, we used the same puzzles as 2022. Um, snack cost was around, you know, $40, but again, it was hard. Um, to um you know judge because uh, again it's like the stacks are sort of shared amongst multiple programs this time i did do prizes um so i got had gotten um eight ten dollar gift cards to starbucks um they were like from amazon i got two packs um each with four ten dollar gift cards in it um which was eighty dollars but those all weren't used at the uh at the tournament so only five were used for one team um, and then the others I saved for the team trivia night. And then the others left over from that were just like door prizes for our end of summer, um, party. So, uh, next slide. So we had more teens came, um, so we had 18 teens and four teams. So, uh, three of the teams had five and one team had three, uh, participants. Um, one team did finish in time. Um, and so each team did get each player on that team got a $10 gift card to Starbucks. Um, some of the um, teens did work on their puzzles um, even after the one team won till eight because they asked if they could. Um, but I did feel like some of the teams after the prizes, like one team won and they weren't going to get a prize, they sort of became unmotivated. Um, so, um, well, you'll see in the next slide for my plans for this year. So, <laughs> next slide. So, um, for this year, I'd like to try to have second or third place, place prizes um, to help keep the other teams motivated. Because while some did want to keep working, others were like, oh, well, now we're not, get, not getting a prize. So that is one thing I'd like to try to do, um, but have smaller prizes so everyone gets, you know, something. And then, as I said, leftover prizes are used at other events because we try to have prizes at all um, at all our different events and at our end of summer party, there's like door prizes and everything. Um, I would like to also try to get new puzzles um, with like that um, ad adventure theme. Um, but I guess it depends on the budget. If I can't, you know, we'll use the same puzzles again. But um, cause I think the prizes might be more important to the kids than getting new puzzles. Um, next slide. And I think that's it. I should say that it was um, pretty fairly easy you know, you just buy the puzzle, get the snacks, and it's, you know, not too much prep at all. So, but if anyone has any questions, thank you. Buy the puzzles, get the snacks. I like yeah, that. Yeah, it's very simple. Sure. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we do have a couple of questions here, Laura. So Mary is asking, what age range of teens participated? So we had range from grades six to 12. Um, I feel like... Um, I'm trying to think we had, yeah, we did. Cause we had some usually early high school we get. And then like the junior high, mostly it's harder to get like the 11th and 12th graders. Um, but it was um, grade six to 12 is what we allowed. Great. Uh, let's see. Rio has a comment and a bit of a question. So uh, Rio shares, I have purchased some jigsaw puzzles that I found later to have letters behind them, which makes them easier to put together. Um, I assume you used jigsaws that didn't have them. So did you have like a letter coded jigsaw puzzle? I don't think they were because I mean, I didn't notice that, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's I should fancy. Think so. yeah um, I'm trying to, when we had it, um, we had opened the puzzles, like the, the puzzles, like the plastic we opened and then had it in the box. So they just had to open the box and you had to wait till the time, like when I said, begin to open the box, but like, we didn't want to worry about like ripping you know, oh, plastic. that's yeah. So it was yeah. <laughs> pre-open for them, so yes. there was a bad panic. <laughs> yeah. I get it open. Um, so Noreen asks, um, and I. So their first question is, did everyone work on the same design? But I know that you said that there were different designs for each. They were table, different. Right? I made sure it was the same company, so it was still like they were still similar. But I wanted that to be different, just because I was like, well, if we're gonna put this out for people to use, not to have six of the same exact ones, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, and then Noreen went on to say, um, how did you make sure the difficulty level was the same? Were any of the teens like, oh, this is harder than the other tables or? You know, 
it's, I mean, I was, I mean, again, they all kind of, because they were the same company and similar designs, um, they could pick which table they went to. And so there were unused puzzles. So I got six just to have, just in case. But I think only, um, we only used four of the six. So like there were other options. So no one really complained, oh, this one's harder than this one. You know, they all look very similar, but they were still somewhat different. And they could pick which table they went to with, you know, the puzzle. Because there's basically six tables, a puzzle on each table. Oh, okay. So they weren't assigned a table and got stuck with a puzzle that maybe they didn't want. No, no. So they could, you know, and the, like I said, there were, we, we had extra puzzles in case, you know, because I didn't know how they were going to break up with te in teams. You know, I wanted to give them like the option if they wanted like smaller teams or bigger teams, you know, because kids, it's hard when they're like, they want to be with their friends or, you know. Yeah. So try to like make it just... You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to. You don't. You want to be as easy as possible and have them be happy with what they're working on. So yeah. let's see. Uh, Mary had sort of suggested maybe one of the prizes could be the puzzle itself. Getting to take oh, the puzzle. Oh, that's a good idea. It'd be hard because it's like a team. So that was like the issue. Is like oh, also true. with the prizes was knowing how many prizes you need. That's why I got extra because I'm like, well, how many? Or say if they tie or say if the team's bigger or smaller. Right. So it's kind of, that's a little bit more of the complicated part, but. You each get 250 pieces of this puzzle and then that's, that's your prize. <laughs> um, so we are at, let me see, I think we're at time right now. We are. So Laura, there were a couple more questions in the chat. I don't know if you have a moment to just look through it and maybe answer those. That would be really helpful. Oh, uh, sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh -huh. um, thank you so much to our first four presenters, Amy, Amy, Priscilla, and Laura. This is a wonderful way to start our program today. Uh, we are going to take a short break at We groan our jokes to make us all chuckle for a little bit. It's appreciated. <laughs> all right. Well, we are into our second hour here. We have four more great presentations and a lot more information on programming coming up here. I am LJ Martin from the Chautauqua Cataraugus Library System. And just a couple quick reminders before we get started here. Um, for those of you who have just joined us, if you can change your name to what you registered with, both first and last. The easiest way is at the top right-hand corner of your picture. There are three little dots where you can just click and then change name. That helps our back-end team getting, getting everything registered so um, your consultants can send out some certificates at the end of this. The second reminder is any questions that you have for our presenters, if you could just put a cue in front of the question in the chat, it makes it a little bit easier for Again, the background team to find the questions so we can get those asked and answered for you. With that being said, we're gonna move on to our first presenter of this hour, um, presenters. They're gonna be talking about live action Mario Kart and um, welcome Sarah Noshak and Eileen Kelly from Long Beach Public Library. <laughs> Over to you. Hi everyone, how are you? <laughs> Waiting for presentation to come up. So give us a second. Yay. All right. Um, so I'm Sarah Nashak at the Long Beach Public Library. I'm the YA uh, librarian trainee. And I'm a children's librarian in the department. All right. And today we're going to talk about our Midsummer Slump program that we're doing. It's uh, interactive or live action Mario Kart. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna get started just talking about um, a little bit of background on our library as a whole. Um, so last year was kind of a game over and I promise you this whole presentation isn't just going to be bad video game puns, but- um, But they will be there. They will be there. <laughs> so uh, we kind of go over what we did. You know, um, we had really low numbers last year. We had basically no teen participation. So um, we sat down, me and Eileen, at the end of last summer talking about, you know, what are we going to do to get SRP numbers back up again, especially for our teens? Um, so, you know, I run a video game club that's really popular. So we thought, you know, how can we get video games in here? Um, that's not just a regular tournament. So that's how this idea came about. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we started by saying, you know, who are we going to target? And at this point, you know, 
we knew we wanted to do a teen and a kid program, so we decided to break it up into two brackets. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about our teens, which is 10 to 16. Um, the next thing we kind of thought about is what's going to be the plan. We knew we wanted to do some sort of live action Mario Kart race, but how are we going to do it? Um, so we're going to go over the materials and all that with Eileen in a little bit. Um, but the basic plan was just to make a very, very basic uh, course using some duct tape and other materials inside our auditorium. And the last question I just answered, but where is it going to go? You know, we're lucky enough. We have a nice big auditorium in Long Beach. Um, I will go over some space alternatives for everybody else if you want to do this at your library. Um, but at the next slide, I'll go over our map. All right, so let's go. How are we going to do it? Um, so our sign up registration is going to be exactly the same for any other program. We use our online calendar. Um, once the registrants come in, we're going to assign them to a team for the race. Um, the reason why we're waiting till the day of is because we're going to uh, account for, you know, the no shows, the walk ins, things like that. We don't want to plan the brackets ahead of time. Um, second. Uh, we're going to do space alternatives. So for us, this is a, actually a map of our auditorium at Long Beach. This is where ours is going to be. Um, as you can see, you know, we have a stage, a nice big open space. So that's our course right there is outlined in red. If you don't have a big space like this, it's easily adaptable into a smaller program room. Or if you know you're feeling a little chaotic, like sometimes we are, you can always do it in your stacks in the library, but they just have to be wide enough for the kids to race through. Um, so you can see here through the map, there's uh, a little banana peel. If you know Mario Kart, you know what that does to you. Um, so the banana peel, if the kid runs over it, it will be laminated to the floor. Um, a staff member or a teen volunteer will run out and spin them around, just like in the game. Um, and in the mushroom towards the finish line, if you run it over, um, you get a bit of a speed boost also by a staff member or a volunteer. Um, so our races will be um, through that red line, like I said, the start and finish line, um, and some staff members in the center. Um, so that's our map. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to Eileen, who's gonna go over the rest of the details. Next slide, please. So how did we get ready to actually prepare this? We have not done this program yet, so we've only done a test run with a couple of our team volunteers just mm -hmm. to kind of give a little bit of an actual real life situation to what we can expect this year. Uh, we prepared our course by using some of our folding tables to block out the staff staging area in the center, mm -hmm. just so that we are corralled, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the track is laid out on the floor with various different colors of duct tape. The interaction icons are printed, laminated, and also duct taped to the floor. So when the kids run over them, as if they were playing in the actual video game. Like Sarah said, one of our teen volunteers who has a nice young back will come out and grab them and spin them around or push them. <laughs> um, we also have trucker hats with character faces on. It's a me, Mario. <laughs> and then they can use those to help bring a little bit more fun to the table and delineate which character they are. They also use the corresponding scooter that matches the color from their hat so that they all are obvious their character. Um, the tournament brackets, as Sarah said, will be prepared day of, but it is a basic three players at each race, three laps per race to keep it moving. Um, we expect hopefully about eight races to happen, maybe more. <laughs> um, we are going to have an actual physical leaderboard in the form of a rolling dry erase board that we're going to put some removable cricket vinyl on to make it look like the actual leaderboard in the Mario Kart. And our screen will be down playing some run throughs of different various courses just to kind of have something else in the room for the kids to watch while the races are happening. Uh, next slide, please. Our pit crew, that's us. Uh, we're going to need about six people on hand for the day of the event. We are planning to have three library staff and three teen volunteers on hand for the program. Uh, one person will be responsible for each interaction point because it's their job to just pay attention to see which kid's running over that point at the time so that they can be the banana or the mushroom. One person at the start and finish line to wave the checkered flag and officially call the winner. One person at the sign-in or the bracketing leaderboard. And one person floating as necessary, maybe to reset or retape things, depending on how it goes in the actual gameplay. 
Uh, next slide. Budget, very important. This was really, really low budget because we owned a lot of the materials and a lot of the materials were using our simple things like paper and tape, so that was cool. Um, overall, in total, we spent about $260 and we're gonna be able to do this for the younger kids as well as the teens. And that also includes the, um, as we lovingly call them, booty scooters, the little floor scooters that you used in gym in elementary school. Um, course materials, including like supplementary paper. We got a roll of brick printed bulletin board paper to put around the perimeter of the room to dress it up and prizes, which are on the next slide as well. Next slide. <laughs> so we have some of our pre-planned hats like the one that I showed you and the winners of the tournaments will get to keep their hats as well. In addition to um, you can see the booty scooties and the various materials that we'll be using. Our first, second, and third place prizes will be the first place is a 2000 piece Mario brick building set. Uh, second place is a Bowser shell plush. And there actually is like a secret pocket where you can hide stuff inside it. <laughs> and a 10 ticket bundle for the third place winner to put into any of our raffles for summer reading. Uh, next slide. Well, that's the last <laughs> slide. So if there are any questions, we're game. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a fantastic program and an excitement here in the chat. A um, couple of questions came through. Um, mm -hmm. With your experience with the duct tape, did it really stick to the floor? Um, did it pick up any carpet or the tile I, or leave residue? I could totally answer this one. So we kind of did a, an unnecessary test run with, uh, I do a story walk in our children's room. Um, and I ended up using colored duct tape for one of the stories. And surprisingly, with our specific carpet tiles, I can't speak for everybody's. It does not stick like um, too hard where it leaves residue. It actually stays like the perfect amount. It doesn't come up. And we were able to get it without ripping out our carpet. Um, so I would definitely, if you're going to do that, do a test run with your carpeting in the area. Um, another good alternative is um, we, since we have a stage, we have a whole um, programming department who orders, you know, the tech stuff um, and they had uh, stage tape and it actually did not stick at all. So stage tape is also a good alternative and it blends oh, into most carpets. Yeah. Yeah. So stage oh, tape great. over duct tape. Definitely. Okay. Um, Renee asked, did you, can you put in a link that you used or where you got the scooters and hats from? I Everything was from Amazon. Amazon, though, yes. But yeah, I absolutely know. can. We'll <laughs> drop a link. <laughs> um, and then how do how are you going to give them a speed boost? Um, so we're going to have our little teen volunteers run around. We already have one of my teen volunteers is like already game for it. He's training already. <laughs> so he's going to run up behind them and, you know, kind of put his hands either on the base of the scooter if the kids are comfortable right on their back and just push them forward a little bit. Nothing crazy we're not trying to go like it's a two the bullet boost. bill status <laughs> <laughs> just a little boost <laughs> makes sense but that'll be fun um and approximately how large is the room that you use uh, i don't know the square footage um it, it's a decent size we can fit about 250 patrons inside it oh, wow. through fire marshal so it's a large space um uh, i did find you can do alternatives like i said if you have a smaller size program room and just scale it down um, you can also, if you're lucky enough, we don't, we're in a city, unfortunately, we don't have um, a parking lot, but if you are comfortable doing it in a parking lot, you can certainly do so, um, but obviously be careful for uh, getting skinned knees and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you can cheap it up and use chalk, sidewalk chalk. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both, Sarah and Eileen. This sounds like a great program um, and appreciate the alternatives that you looked into as well. Thank you Thank so much, you. everyone. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Next, we're going to be learning about life beyond high school from Amanda Bido at the Myers Memorial Library. So, Amanda, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to um, share with you guys today about life beyond high school, which really is just a young adult um transition program from high school to adult. Like so many people um, call this like adulting 101, um, life skills, things like that. And um, it started with where I was before I was um, in a library in Pennsylvania. And this is actually where I ran it and won a best practices award for this. 
And so next slide, let's talk a little bit about the program itself. So today we're gonna to talk about introduction, getting started, who to collaborate, what are your resources, what do your teens need and things like that. So next slide. So we started, I ran this program twice, um, but I'm going to talk about my original program. So we did a six session program series where we explored with teens multiple paths about high, after high school. Who are they? That's the biggest thing we have found that the more they get to know who they are and their strengths and weaknesses now, the more confident they feel after high school and learning more about the paths and different things that they can do. Um, what are they searching for? We also did a vision board to kind of help lay it out so they can see what they're talking about and maybe identify some challenges or get more excited about what they're looking at. Um, we went over how to present them uh, professionally. And each session we offered interactive exercises. So we did like a 15 minute lecture, but then we also did like an activity so they could actually learn what they were, um, use what they were learning. Uh, most importantly, we found that a lot of teens are intimidated by a lot of terms that people use for colleges, um, workforce development, uh, jobs, all this kind of stuff. There's these daunting terms that we just throw at them, but they don't actually understand them. So we worked a lot to demystify them in these um, sessions. We wanted our community invested. So we did a lot with that. We're going to talk about that in a couple slides. We want to incorporate life skills learning and we wanted participant, participants to have something at the end that would act as a tool to help them move forward. So next slide. So some of our sessions included um, we use activities like, I don't know if anyone has this database, but it's an amazing database. The Peterson Test and Career Prep Database has amazing personality and career assessments, but there's so many out there that you could use for free um, if you don't have this database. We also used a military PACE program for team building. We wanted them to take a program. This one was like a lifeboat kind of survival thing that the military had, but we actually turned it into a haunted house, like escape the haunted house, which was really fun because we ran this in October. Um, and basically what they learned from this is they numbered how they would escape the haunted house based off of using different tools and things like that. They numbered how they would use those tools by themselves. And then they did it in a team and it gave them a lot of insight on how they work in a team and how they work solo. Um, and we want them to really point that out so they can understand how they work. Um, so when they get to a job or college or do a, a group activity of any sort, they kind of understand themselves and how they work with that. We also had presentations from local area HR professionals and college admission officers to go over things like cover letters, resumes, college applications, things like that. We created the vision board. We worked on building a mission statement. Um, we wanted them to walk away with something where just a like a short paragraph can explain who they are. So it kind of helps them to keep exploring that in their future. We even helped them set up a LinkedIn account. So that was kind of fun. So we're going to talk next about the session. So next slide. So each, each session was 45 to 60 minutes long. Uh, teens tend to peter out at that 45 minute thing, especially if it's like hard stuff. And this is hard stuff. So we tried to keep them 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, we did this uh, for six months consecutively. It was the last Thursday of every month. Um, and then I also ran a program where we did it like every two weeks. So each kind of works. I actually had um, 15 teens repeatedly go to every session for the six month one, as well as the other one where we ran it like every two weeks. So uh, I saw success in, in both ways. So you can just really tailor this to however you want to run it and however many sessions you want. Um, audience age. Now, the first time I ran this, we did this with teens 15 and up. And then we also did some adults because adults 
are also looking for this information because a lot of times, especially if for COVID, they're transferring or they're transitioning from what they're doing now to something else because they had to, but they don't have a guidance counselor to tell them how to do it. So this kind of gave them information to help, but also I wanted teens to see that adults also make different choices down the road, that sometimes you may not stick with just one thing it may change and transition several times. And it really helped teens to hear that. They're like, wow. So I don't have to have everything right now. And we're like, no, like sometimes it's, it really is a journey. So we did information for the first 15 to 20 minutes. Then we did the activity. And then we also ended the session with a self-care action. We wanted them, this is stressful stuff. So we want them to just take a breather for a minute, but then we also wanted to make sure that they understand how to practice self-care. So that was really fun. We did incentives. So we did have food at the sessions. All food was donated by community members. So we had a sheets um, gas station that donated snacks. We had bakeries donate snacks. We had a wrestling club donate snacks and stuff like that. Um, we also had prize baskets. So each time they came to a program, they got a raffle ticket for coming to the program. And at the end, we raffled away big prize baskets full of donate gift cards and items from local businesses and organizations. And then we also had our program passport, um, which was what I was talking about, where they actually could write down stuff from the session where they can actually look back to that. So we have like this program passport, which I do have this available to show everyone in a link. I also use it as a place to show the people that were donating and as a, a thank you. So it was right in the program packet. The self-care practices are here. Um, their, their assessments and things like that, they could keep right here. So it's an easy tool for resumes. Okay, so go to the next slide. Getting started. So step one, ask teens what they need. Get teens talking to you about what they think they need to be successful. You can do surveys, have gatherings, things like that. Step two is get your community invested. Find who in your community would be willing to share skills that they excel at with teens, or would they like to help with incentives for the teen program? Step three, list your resources, which we're going to go over more of. Step four, you want to start planning the sessions. Ask yourself, what will they learn? How will they learn? When and how long will the sessions be? And who's the audience? Step five, what will our incentives be? Again, these don't have to be big and expensive. You can ask for donations, um, or you could just think of it as like this paper. Like, this is super valuable. And actually, the teens really love this paper. And then step six, reference materials. Ask yourself, what are they taking with them after the session? So next slide. So who to collaborate? Well, all businesses have something to gain from this. Show support for a nonprofit. It shows support for improving the lives of the customers. It's investing in the future workforce that they employ from. So we did donation letters and we went around and basically that's kind of what we were marketing toward them. Like these are some things to think about on why you would want to donate something to this. So area organizations, think of your community organizations around you that you can collaborate with. So I collaborated with um, our YMCA. I've collaborated with um, the wrestling club, colleges, uh, different area businesses, HR professionals came out to talk to our students. Uh, other foundations and other nonprofits came in, like our high ed and things like that. I listed some other ideas there. You could drop some ideas in the comments. We, I also used our, um, artists and hobbyists, people that already excel at something and maybe have a small business, and they came in and talked to the students learning institutions. So those are some ideas there. Next slide. Resources page. So some things that we can use in these sessions to build on different life skills, role-playing games, board games, books, library things, maker spaces or STEM items, references, things like that, online apps and databases. Next slide. And this is the most important thing. 
so many people have ideas of what teens should be prepared for for adulthood, but some might be out of date. So here's some ideas of like balance a checkbook I heard often. Instead, find a financial institution to talk to them about money management. How to do taxes? Well, a lot of the online tax services are free for what they need to do, but they do need to understand the forms they fill out for jobs. Then I also included a list here of things that, that most teens I've talked to are looking for. They want to learn how to sew, cook, bake, job application help. They want to make money fast. They want to know how to start a business. Social skills are huge. I hear this often because these are kids that... Um, you know, were either in grade school or they were in middle school and they don't know how to find friends and how to engage with them. And then terminology and concepts. So all these different things can help you build your own program for your own community and how you want to do it. So next all right. Time. And I'm going to jump in here because I know you're at the end here. Yes. Your contact information. One question came through. Um, how big is the community that you serve? So the community okay. I served before was about um, 9,000. So we were a smaller city, um, but I I feel like now I'm in a place that we're like 3,000 people. I think it's more like 2,000 now uh, from when I graduated. Um, and I do feel like the way that I have ran this program and the different things to think about will work in no matter what community. It's just based off of, um, really showing others like how invested being in this community can really help that future. You know, instead of just saying, hey, they need to learn this, come help me. You know, it's kind of more like that. Like, come help me do that. <laughs> like, what can you add to that to help them and say, instead of saying, they need to learn this, that, and the other thing and always connect with your school as much as possible. The high school shouldn't do this alone. That's fantastic. And what a great message, come help me because the teens are part of our community. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for this program. It sounds like a wonderful one. Um, if any more questions come up in the chat, if you want to take a look at those, uh, absolutely, really appreciate you sharing with us today. Thank you. All right, we're going to go from life beyond high school to adventures with the four elements. Um, this, um, this program is going to be presented by Dania Swade from the Baldinsville Public Library, apologize if I butchered that name, um, but your your presentation is up and it is on to you. Okay, great. Yes, no, that was all correct. My name is Dania. I'm the Young Adult Services Librarian at the Baldwinsville Public Library in Onondaga County. When I was thinking um, adventure for the summer's theme, I thought about the four elements. And if we go to the next slide, so you probably know the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water. And I thought what also makes it really interesting is to do like a historical international overview of these four elements. So under each one, I put some like general topics. So each week you could focus on a different element. Uh, and in the beginning of the program, give kind of like a historical lesson about each one, because it's really interesting how both independently and convergently, cultures around the world had adapted and used these four elements and how essential it became to their culture and their traditions and their rituals. So talking about that, especially in an international perspective, would be really interesting and important for the teams to look at. So you could take, you know, fire and how it was used in some Asian cultures and how it was used in Central African cultures or especially like in the indigenous people in North America and how each general category was kind of broken down in unique and independent ways. So, um, and then also the last part of each, like the hot and dry, cold and dry, that was a very like Aristotle um, perspective of the four elements. And that's an interesting one to start with because I think that's a person the teens probably can identify and have heard of the most. So it's a good starting point, but there's a lot more to that historically and a mystical view of them as well. That's really great and interesting. So to start each program kind of with that overview is great. And then followed by an activity. And so if we go to the next slide, I have broken down some of the activities per uh, element. So for fire, we were going to start with solar oven, an activity I've done before. Here, um, so you could ask a pizza shop maybe to donate 
pizza boxes, but I just used a cardboard box and cut three along three of the lines so that it had an upward flat. And you cover the whole inside with aluminum foil. And on the bottom is just a piece of black construction paper. And inside you could put like marshmallows if you want to make s'mores or uh, it'll melt cheese in there. But uh, we'll be doing crayons because I thought what an interesting way to also get the, the artistic impact almost of the sun. So as the sun is melting the crayons, it's going to leave like melted puddles and they could uh different colors and they can move the solar oven around and see what differences that makes. So if you wanted to add kind of like a steam element to uh, steam educational element to the program, right? You could put different pieces of colored paper on to talk about how black absorbs heat. So the inside of the solar oven is going to be hotter. It can get up to like 200 degrees Fahrenheit in there. So you could have a few set up from the morning so when the teens come in they can look and see the differences um and um you could use different colors you can also adjust the angle of the lid because depending on the angle of the sun's rays that you want to reflect inside of the box uh depending on that how you adjust the top of the lid is going to make a difference to how hot the inside of the oven gets um so that's really interesting. And I picked the oven in particular because the fire element is now for first, we maybe don't want to give the teens fire, to, actual fire to use, but the importance of the sun in relation to the fire element and how both powerful and dependent cultures over time and still are, we are on the sun and how it's like revered, but also feared. And so how a lot of cultures and rituals were prayers and just offerings to the sun because they were so dependent on that in every aspect of their life. And similarly, if we go to the next slide, that fear and awe and dependence is also for the water. We know how um, terrifying water can be in natural disasters um, and also how dependent we are every day on water. I know it's a little bit cut off, uh, but that's okay. I'll talk to you about it. So for the water, element we will be making these kind of flowing candles so for this one i have pre-purchased just like the bulk stick candles and attach them to a jar lid you could also thrift small plates if you want it to be uh less expensive and if you melt the bottom of the candle you can stick it onto the lid and you can purchase bulk candle wax you won't need a ton per person i usually do about like 10 to 15 kids um, they'll pour the hot wax into the jar lid and then take the whole thing and put it into a big bowl of water. And the wax, that melted wax, will immediately harden. So if they're spinning the bowl or if they're spinning the actual candle and the lid, the wax is going to harden in the flow and the shape of the water. So it really gives this like physical rep representation of how water flows and moves. And so this was kind of my first attempt, but later um, getting the movement right, you can create like almost like big long waves from the wax. So it really does look like, um, it becomes like this elaborate, they also come like Gothic candles and they do look like they've got that Gothic kind of classic feel to it. And um, in terms of like the historical elemental lesson with it as well, uh, they can relate to like the power and the potential like uh, destruction that the water can cause and the fear that comes a lot with that. Because if they start spinning the bowl too fast or the water too fast, the wax is just gonna fall out of the jar lid and it's just gonna be like little bits of wax all in the water. So they're not gonna get the same kind of candle. Um, but it is a fully functioning candle because um, you can use mica powder or food coloring, but I really would use mica powder to color the wax and then a little bit of essential oil. So it's a fully functioning candle for later. And the next element we have, yes, is earth. Um, so for earth, again, in terms of like a historical elemental lesson, it is really interesting how across cultures and languages, there is, uh, the earth is, 
so referred to in like a feminine way and mother earth and how important it is in terms of like nurturing and healing and how dependent we are in terms of the growth for food and everything using the earth so it's really that kind of what i would focus on and well with the teens is like the that independent realization to like the same conclusion is really interesting so how the different cultures over time have always or at least often made it that kind of feminine mother like supportive nurturing and dependence on that as an element for earth so what we're going to make for after that lesson because um these are teens and mushrooms are still like such a great aesthetic that they're really interested in uh you can make them with dried fruit peels that's what i did here or um because that takes a little bit of time they could also use like um cardboard egg cartons but for the fruit peels uh, i used an orange tree you could use anything that has like a thicker peel and they can peel it and rip it into their desired pieces and shapes and then it just needs to be dried in an oven. So if they use smaller pieces, they could probably, they'll get dried quicker. So it could only be like 15 to 20 minutes. And then this one we just painted however we'd like and used twigs and hot glue to attach it together. With the mushroom heads, um, the nice part of the egg carton is it's kind of already shaped, like where the egg goes. It's, if you flip it upside down, it's kind of already mushroom shaped. Um, and so they could just like paint and decorate that and use whatever they'd like as a stem. But besides just mushrooms as like a popular aesthetic, um, the importance about that I also really liked in terms of the lesson for the teens is how essential they are as they as decomposers in the environment. So as they get they're creating more nutrients into the soil and they're decomposing dead things that like could be damaging and could be uh, like have a potentially a negative impact on the environment and these mushrooms are now healing the soil and the earth and the other living things around them and how essential that is both culturally and currently how depend like how useful in cultivating these mushrooms and protecting our environment um all of that is related to the earth element so if we go to our final one, which is air. So for me, air is like, it's a very, a little trickier because there's so many, air kind of encompasses a lot of different things, especially if you look uh, culture around the world, what like considered um, a part of the air element. And there's even like a fifth element slightly related to air. Um, but firstly, the craft that we would be making is these anemometers that determine wind speed. So here it's just, I just used a pencil and that plastic cup and poked four holes in it. And then Danielle, the straws. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in real quick. We have about 30 seconds left. Uh, is there any one big main point you want to leave us with? Oh, um, no, I mean, if people want to keep looking through other ones, um, there, yeah, I've got just some media you can look through. And then if you wanted to make an eight week program, there's other ideas. But other than that, yeah, it's just a nice lesson with an accompanying um, activity that relates to them. Yeah. Perfect. And I, I apologize. I wish we had more time. Um, sure, no, no problem. On it. But yeah. this sounds great. And um, Dania's information is here. And just a reminder in a couple weeks, uh, we will send out all these presentations as well. So um, anyone viewing will be able to get the. Um, the decks or slide decks and use the ideas that way. Um, Dania, there are a couple of questions in the chat on specific of the elements. If you could take a look at those in, in answer, okay. that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for this program. It sounds like a great oh, yeah, one. Course. Thank you. All right, we are on to our last presenter of this hour. Um, and we're gonna be talking about robotic, ro try that word again, robotics club, and it's going to be with Juan Tang, I hope I said that correctly, uh, from the Tompkins County Public Library. So I'm excited to hear about some robots here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joa Tang, but don't worry, I respond to all J names. Um, <laughs> it's a very strange name. Anyways, yes, we're going to talk about the TCPL Robotics Club. Um, it is a very holistic program, so I'm pulling out the autonomous robot racing part of it, which is a very beginner-friendly 
and is made for people who haven't really played with electronics yet. Go ahead to the next slide. So a little background on me. Um, I work as a library assistant at the Tompkins County Public Library. I work in youth services, teen service, as teen services, and makerspace. Um, so I work with all ages. Uh, this robotics club can be geared towards teens. It can be geared towards tweens and even families with kids with ages three and up, um, as long as the parents are there to help. Uh, I am also a STEM, edu STEM educator outside of the library, and I am currently an engineering student um, at WGU, and I am, uh, my background is in recreation leadership and project management. Um, next slide. Um, so here's some history. Our makerspace opened up in 2017, and then our club was built out of outreach for youth. So we started in a middle school, and then the kids from the middle school came to the library asking how their robots were doing, and then they started tinkering on them, and then that's where the club went. We just decided to offer it as a program. Um, at this point, we serve between 15 and 45 um, youth throughout the week um, with open hours, uh, weekly programming where there's lessons and programs where you learn how to code. Um, so as you can see in the slide here, we've done things like first person view rovers where we took racing drones apart and threw them on an RC tank. Uh, we've done combat robotics and we've raced cars that follow lines. We've also had local entomologists come in and talk about insects and how they walk, where we taught kids how to program a hexapod robot to walk and wrestle each other. Kids really like com competitions. So that's why it's either racing or wrestling. Um, and at the current time, we have developed a bunch of curriculum that's open source and featured on Instructables. Um, it is a website called instructables.com. It's ran by Autodesk. And our robot racing program has won an award from them. And we're also presenting these at several make fairs, including Rochester, New York, Syracuse, New York, which is on May 4th, if you guys want to come out and try the cars and also Orange County, California, and Los Angeles, California, because that's where robots are. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what is robot racing? Um, the robot racing program uh, was developed to provide a, comp a competition um, for kids who just want to tinker. Um, the way these cars work is they use infrared sensors. Um, the way you can think of an infrared sensor is if you chuck a bouncy ball off a wall, it comes back at you. And that's how a sensor works. It throws infrared light, it hits a surface, it bounces back. And if it sees that and catches it, the car's motor turns off. Um, we can get into details with the technology behind this if you want to read the manuals that are included in this presentation, and I'll include it in the slides. Um, so we have here at TCPL uh, 3D printers and laser cutters. But as you can see in here, you don't need that. You just need electronics and some cardboard and duct tape. Um, that's how we started. And the reason why we switched from line following to walls is because we were using up so much electrical tape that it was making quite a bit of waste. So we partnered with a local Girls Who Code from the Women in Computing at Cornell. And our first robot race uh, was with teens ages 12 through 18 who came in, built the cars, and then built the racetrack with the Girls Who Code group. Um, and we are actually featured in their 40th anniversary. Uh, you can find the article to that at the end of these slides. Um, next slide, please. So the Thomas Robot Racing, why we did it was one, it's inexpensive, uh, depending on Amazon or robotshop.com, which is a really good resource if you want to find kits and stuff, and um, is the price. These cars, especially the ones that don't use a computer, costs about 11 to $18, dependent on where you're ordering them from. Um, the ones that have an Arduino, so an Arduino is a microcontroller, which is a very small computer that you can either upload Scratch coding to or C++. Um, those cars will cost around $18 to $25. Um, another thing too is this is very beginner friendly. There's no soldering involved. Everything is like a Lego piece. You plug it in and it works. Um, and the cars are also very rechargeable. And the thing that we were focusing on, the main goal was replayability and the idea that it's easy to learn, but hard to master. So we gamified this a lot because um, we wanted the kids to be interactive and playing. Um, we find here that playing is a really good tool to learn, especially when it comes to digital learning and technical skills like soldering, electronics, and coding. Um, next slide, please. So how it was developed, um, we took inspiration from several popular toy lines. Uh, 
Chiroku is a toy line in Japan of collectible pullback cars that you can modify with different bumpers. And they actually use the infrared system as well. So these cars will, the kids will set up a racetrack and the car will drive around it. Um, these cars are not produced here in the United States, so we couldn't use them as a tool. And if they were, they'd be extremely expensive. Um, next, uh, the idea of tuning up, the way these analog cars work, the ones without a computer, is you program them by physically adjusting the sensor's angles, changing the car tires. And on the bottom of the car, we have skids that we call uh, brake pads that have varying levels of friction to them. So for example, if you have a car with less friction in the front, it'll go faster. Um, but because of the way it's designed, it might have a hard time turning because it's like a blade versus the very pancake shaped brake pad that is a circle that allows it to turn in different areas. You can adjust where the motors are. So the closer you are to the center of the car, the easier it turns, the further away from the center of the car, the better it drives in a straight line. So you're physically programming these cars through physics. And that's why we use the Toyline Mini 4WD. If you're not aware of it, um, it was a science and technology toy that came out in the 90s and still is going to the day to this day where you make a motorized car and you race them in rain gutters. And then finally, the whole idea behind this, this was developed throughout the pandemic. And then finally, when we can come back and in-person programming, um, we partnered, of course, with the Women in Computing at Cornell to put on a big race. But during that time, there was Robo Race, which was this great live stream Twitch event with Formula Electric. Um, and the kids could interact with the engineers who built full size autonomous race cars that broke the world speed record at 135 miles an hour. So the kids got to get hands on with that. And finally, the main goal of this is replayability. Um, a lot of times when we do robotics kits and science kits, the kids do the project and they play with it once and they're done. Um, these cars have been used for the past six years and um, they have not gotten bored with it because of the adjustability of the sensors and the wheels the amount of different driving lines. So a driving line is how you drive around a racetrack will dictate how fast you go is infinite. You can make almost infinite driving lines using just two sensors and two motors. Um, next slide, please. So for budget, um, this will be accessible once you get my slides. If you want to access all the parts, there are links. This is for 25 analog cars. And remember analog cars do not use computers. It is just a hard circuit. It sees a wall, it turns away from the wall and you can adjust how fast and how long it turns away from the wall by whether or not you turn up the sensor at what angle it is or where you screw it in into the chassis or duct tape it if you're using cardboard and foam. Um, so this is accessible to you. Uh, this is a budget for 25 cars. Um, when we do the program, we usually have uh, teams of three kids working on or three teams working on a single car. So this year you can imagine is for 75 participants. And this is how many cars I've brought to make fair and have served over 300 participants at once. Um, these cars are highly durable. You can chuck them behind your back, crash them off the table, step on them. Um, they're not gonna break. Um, so the way our program runs is we will either do an open hour kind of style where it is first come first serve until the room is maxed out and we max out about 45 people. Um, that I would not suggest that as your first go at this if you decide to use it, but once you get more experience, you can make it an open hour and anyone who shows up can tinker on these cars. Um, the very first one was an eight week program in collaboration with a local university where we broke this down into steps um, where each um, week we met and talked about a component on the car. Uh, we got the motors running. We learned how the sensors turned on and off a motor driver. We learned how different wheel sizes affect the car. Um, and that was registration based. And because I had um, about one to two, one volunteer to two participants, we opened it up to 15 kids. So I had um, quite a good team with me. Um, for looking for resources for this, I would definitely suggest checking out your local universities. Um, you can contact me. Uh, one thing that we've decided here at TCPL is because of how popular this is, this program is also being run in Anderson, New York at an elementary school and being used at a Polytechnica um, college for their STEM outreach in Canada. And we're also um, working with a few public libraries out West and a few public libraries out here in New York um, to provide this. So if you want in-person live training, you can do it for free here at the library. You can contact me and set up a time in our makerspace. I also offer virtual trainings um, for free through my library contact. Or if you want me to come out and set it up for you, um, you can contact me through my STEM educator contact and we can talk about honorariums and stuff like that. Um, 
So with this program, the whole idea is to get kids excited about coding, excited about robotics and learning about digital literacy. This is a really good way for kids to learn how to use a keyboard, how to access the computer, um, how when you plug a wire into something, it does something. Um, robots, the reason why we do them is it is tangible code. When you code something um, and you put it in a robot, you see that code and how it works physically. So thank you guys. All right, that's fantastic. What a great program. Um, you had mentioned that this is a good program for kids who might not even be experienced in robotics or coding. Do those kids take to it pretty well? Yes, actually the slide there where you saw my group of tweens, um, mm -hmm. that was taken about five years ago and each and every one of them stuck through until high school and some of them have gone off to college to study engineering. Oh, wow, um, that's awesome. Yeah, the thing is with this program, it hides the idea of learning technology behind, I'm gonna race you, I'm gonna put parts on my car and make it go faster. Um, so yeah, it really sticks with the youth, especially when you like give it to them, like it's okay if you make a mistake, you can't break this. That, that's helpful to know when you can't break things. <laughs> and if you do, they learn how to put it back together. <laughs> that's fair. All right, that's fantastic. I hope. Um, think you might get a few contacts there for a little bit of help on, on the other library side. Thanks again for that. So that brings us to the end of our... And let me just turn it right over to Heidi. Great. Thanks, Lori. That I think that last line sort of sums up what is it what it's like to work in youth services, right? So all <laughs> kinds of fun stuff going on there. Hey everybody, welcome to the third and the last hour of our program today. My name is Heidi, and don't panic if you missed any of this today. Uh, we're recording it and we're gonna send it out to you uh in a little while. So um everything is coming to you, slides, all that good stuff. Um, just wanted to put out a few friendly reminders. Make sure that you are muted. Make sure that your name is showing correctly on your Zoom screen so we can make sure our attendance list is accurate. And we will have time for questions. If you do have questions, you can put them in the chat. If you put a big Q in front of your question that helps our folks um, behind the scenes, pick out those questions so we can ask them to our presenters at the end of their session. Um, our friendly shark, Jack, is going to be keeping time for us. And when you see that shark shake, that two-minute sign, it means you are, uh, you're counting down. So you got two minutes, you got then the, the timer that will show in your screen when you're down to one minute. Uh, but I think things have been humming along beautifully today, time-wise. So uh, without further ado, if I stop talking, we'll stay on that time that time uh, pattern here. We're going to kick off the third hour with Sarah Creveline from Penyan Public Library with Adventures in Self-Care. Uh, Sarah, it's all you. Hi, everybody. Uh, yep, I am in Penyan, which is a town of about 5,000 in the Finger Lakes, and we have all three dollar stores, if that gives you an idea of our town. And that is where you will find all of the supplies for Adventures in Self-Care. Next slide, please. This is uh, four weeks. Um, each week has a different topic. And the first topic um, is sleeping well, because nobody does that. And all we can really do is try, right? So um, each week is kind of set up in the same way. We do an activity and a very casual talk about this domain of self-care. So the first week for sleeping well, we're going to make a scented eye pillow. And as we're doing that, we're going to talk casually about sleep hygiene. So um, once you get your hands on the presentation, the images are linked. Um, that one on the left is linked to the CDC recommendation. That is a lot of sleep that tweens and teens need. Um, and I bet they're not getting it. And we're going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, how to get it. And on the right, that link is to how to make an eye pillow out of a sock and rice and essential oil. Um, the essential oil is the most expensive thing in the program, but if you have some lying around, you'll only need a couple drops. Basically, you just add the oils of your choice to some rice, shake it around, use a funnel or a paper cone or something to fill the sock, 
pretty much halfway or less, and then just tie a knot in it. You need to use a crew sock. You can find those at the dollar store. And then you have a great eye pillow. And while you're making that, you can talk about, you know, putting your phone away 20 minutes before you go to bed, um, keeping your bedroom cool, dark lights off, all that kind of stuff we all know, but none of us ever do. Next slide, please. So for week two, we are eating well. Um, we are going to make cowboy caviar, and we're going to talk about what different color foods do in your body. Um, the picture of cowboy caviar goes to a recipe from Snap. Um, yeah, if you are worried about allergies, uh, go for it. Um, you know your community best. Uh, you can advertise that, you know, we're going to be serving this food or having these smells or whatever. Um, you can make them outdoors. Maybe that would help with strong smells. Um, so cowboy caviar has a lot of different mm -hmm. colors in it and, um, different colored foods do different stuff in your body. That image on the left is from Kids Eat in Color, who's a registered dietitian online and her stuff is, she, um, puts her images out geared to different levels. So you can work with the level of comprehension of the audience that you're working with. Um, Cowboy Caviar, the recipe that's linked is from Snap, so it's really economical. It basically involves opening five cans, rinsing off what's in them, dumping them in a bowl, and chopping some onions and squeezing some limes on it. Um, you could change the recipe to whatever works for your community. You can use a slap chopper because kids love cutting things, but who wants to give them knives? Um, you can make it work however is gonna work in your community. And while you're doing it, you're just talking about, you know, this yellow pepper is gonna help you fight off colds and the flu and stuff like that. Next slide, please. So the next one has got a lot of text on it, which is ironic because it's about playing well and moving your body. Um, but the guidelines are there from the CDC that's linked to the CDC. Uh, I'm not linking balloon volleyball anywhere because you're all smart people and I think you can figure out how to play that on your own. And this is a week when you can choose what your kids are into. Like maybe your library has a gaga ball pit or maybe you have a park next door and they love to play hide and seek. Um, at our library, one thing one of our teens invented is, I call it the Jamie game, named after Jamie. So Jamie saw <laughs> that I had a beach ball in my office and the beach ball had numbers written on it. I don't remember why, some other program. And Jamie invented this game that's kind of a getting to know you game. And we used to play it after school when the kids had a lot of energy to burn off. Um, Jamie's now grown up. I haven't seen Jamie in a while. I don't know if Jamie still plays it. But basically, you write numbers on a beach ball, or you use dice, or just one die. And the kid rolls the die or throws up the beach ball and catches it. Their hands land on a number. They tell you the number on it. And then you tell them, do you want a physical challenge or a mental challenge? And they choose. And it's really fun to see what they choose because then, say, they choose a physical challenge and they got the number 12. You can be like, aha! do 12 burpees. And um, it's a great way to exercise your power as a youth services librarian <laughs> and tire out those kids, right? Or it could be, you got three, tell me your top three uh, bucket list vacations you want to go on. So mental challenge, physical challenge, mix them together. Uh, it's just a game. It doesn't feel like you're getting your uh, muscle strengthening CDC guideline. But again, adapt this to your community, do whatever works for you. Next slide, please. Our last week is about coexisting well with each other. Um, these actually aren't clickable links because I did not have the files ready, but I can update them. Um, we're going to snack a chat and we're going to talk about healthy relationships and setting boundaries. So setting boundaries bingo is an idea I borrowed from our local domestic violence prevention agency. And if you have one of those, I suggest partnering with them. Ours comes in and offers weekly programming for free, all about healthy relationships, which is really incredible for, for tweens. Um, and I borrowed this idea from that person. And you use an online bingo board generator and you can populate it with situations and then um, call out the situation. So I think we just situations and then okay. you can talk about like, how would you set a boundary in this particular situation? Uh, did I disappear? 
you froze sorry, just for my... a minute, but it picked right back up. So okay. hopefully we didn't freeze for you, but no, nope, I'll carry on. Okay. My internet connection is unstable, so I think it needs some self-care. Um, then, so that's, you get how Healthy Boundaries Bingo works. And then the Healthy Relationship Scavenger Hunt, I ripped off from somebody from the Teen Services Underground Facebook group. Um, you basically write down a bunch of things and post them around your library. We did this on Valentine's Day and it was really fun. So um, you give them a list and one side is healthy and one side is unhealthy. And as they're going around the library, they find these behaviors and actions and things and write down where they think they belong. So it could be things like trust, respect, uh, good communication, it's safe to express emotions, uh, never ask questions. So some of them are really obvious and some of them aren't. And one of the really fun things when we did this for Valentine's Day was a couple did it, like a, a dating couple of eighth graders. And she was like, no, we should never disagree about anything. And he's like, no, it's okay if we disagree. And they they kind of worked it out, like whether or not it was okay and healthy for their relationship to sometimes disagree about things. And then there was a group of friends who did it. And one of the items is um, gives insulting nicknames. And one person in this friend group, it turned out, gave insulting nicknames. And everybody else in the friend group was like, I don't like when you do this. Can you, you not do that anymore? So they actually talked about different kinds of relationships and different behaviors that are healthy in it. Next slide, please. Oh, and you could have snacks and chat if you want. And finally, um, we have the budget. Like I said, my budget is mostly the dollar store and all these. You may have things on hand um, and it's very cheap as much as free if you want. Next slide, please. And then I had some um, community partners you might think about working with because you have these people in your community. You're probably already working with them, coaches, doctors, uh, domestic violence prevention agencies, cooperative extension, dietitians, people from your community center. Find them and leverage them and borrow stuff from them. And the last slide is my contact info. Great, Sarah, thank you so much. There was so much good information in there. Very budget friendly. Um, and like you said, very easy to find some of those things uh, e wherever you're located, even if it is upstate New York in the Finger Lakes where maybe resources are not, um, it's not like being in an urban center. So uh, we did have a question that came in, a couple of questions actually. So um, this one is from Lois and Lois asks, is this a program where we should have waivers signed for any potential allergies? Um, I, I would leave that up to you. You know your community. Some people don't like essential oils indoors. You know, if, if it's not going to work for your community, don't do it. You can make the eye pillows without the essential oils. Great. And we have another question from uh, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne wonders, did you have the same kids coming in every week for this? I don't know. I haven't done this program yet. <laughs> okay. So um, that'll be something for you to think about. Like, oh, am I getting new folks for, for these different challenges or different, really challenges, but um, opportunities? Um, this is really just take, taking in stuff that we do with our regular after school, middle school crowd and making it formal. So I've done a lot okay. of these activities, just not in this order. Great. So kind of putting them under this umbrella of, you know, teen self-care or youth self-care, which is great. And I guess kind of there's a, another question that kind of asks something too, but you'll find out as you do it this summer. So um you see that question about pushback from parents about healthy relationships yeah. piece? I think that's a really good question. Um, I have not had any pushback. I think what helps is that the organization providing that programming is our local domestic violence prevention center. Um, and I make sure to publicize that, uh, that that's where that information is coming from. Perfect. And that's where it's great to have those partners to help you out and to handle pieces that you may not have you know, the facility with. So fantastic. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing that. And we've got the shark, the upside down. Thank you. But I know, I know, I know we all feel that. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Perfect. Great. And next up, we um, have Kim Naples from the uh, Katona Village Library. I hope I said that right. And uh, Kim is coming at us with the Fantasy Finders Creative Writing Club. So Kim, it's all you. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Kim Naples. I'm from the Katona Village Library in Westchester. I'm gonna be talking about collaborative writing in 
my creative writing club with fifth to eighth graders. We call ourselves the Fantasy Finders. That is a name that they voted on and picked for themselves. So if you decide to do something like this, you can call it whatever you want. This is art made by Sophia Vega, um, an eighth grader, one of the people in our club to help me with promotion. And um, there's my contact information, which I will share again. Next slide, please. So this program is really scalable. I'm gonna be talking about um, a specific group writing exercise that you can do as a one-off. You can do it in series, you know, four week series, a six week series, or you can be like me and invest um, two years meeting every single week, like, and you know, investing your heart and soul into this program like I do. And so I'll be talking about, you know, just this one exercise, and then I'll be talking about how you can push it farther. So this is my group writing exercise details. It costs $11. If you don't already have paper and pens around, you can get them on Amazon for $5 and for $6. So you need paper, you need writing instruments, and you need a way to play music. Time for program planning is 10 to 20 minutes or the time of this presentation. The time for the program itself is an hour to an hour and a half, depending on what you decide to do. Clean up is two seconds. Just get all your pens and papers together and you're done. So your capacity, I would say you need at least four people. This could include yourself or not. You could do a maximum up to 30 people. And age range, um, the youngest I've done this is with fourth graders. And I have done this with adults, too. Um, that's That was my group of 30 people that I did this for. And um, set up, you need a room with groups of four to seven chairs in circles around tables. So my sweet spot is seven participants, which includes myself and an hour and 15 minutes. If you do this and get a big group, you may or may not participate. It's up to you and your numbers. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the instructions for the group writing exercise. You split your participants into groups of four to seven. So fantasy finders were just one big group. Everyone gets a piece of paper and something to write with, and you provide a prompt, which I will have ideas for on the next slide. You set a timer for three to five minutes, again, depending on the size of your group and the length of your program. And then you say, go, you start your story. You play some nice music in the background. I play classical or chill hop. And then the timer goes off and you pass your piece of paper to the left and then receive a story from your right or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And you read what the person or the people before you wrote, and then you continue the story. And you keep going until everyone gets their original story back. And then you read the whole thing, and then you write the ending to your own story. And then you share finished stories with the group. It should be really fun. The finished results that you get, they'll go places you never imagine, and um, it should be a good time. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some tips. So misspelling, grammar mistakes, and bad handwriting are all allowed. Let's not judge each other. This is not school. You're not being graded. It's totally fine to be like, hey, what did you mean when you wrote this? What does this say? As long as you're not judging, it's totally cool. So our goal here is to write for fun. We're not trying to impress anybody. I will say a word about violence. My teens are obsessed with it. So whether or not you allow it is up to you and what you feel capable of dealing with whether you're worried about having to deal with parents. Um, I haven't gotten any pushback on the violence um, from parents in my group. Having tough conversations, like we do talk about, um, you know, they know that I'm a safe person to go to. I've explicitly said, if you have issues, if you need to talk to someone, I'm here for you. And, you know, we have had explicit conversations about there's a difference between violence on the page and violence in real life. And we've made that distinction. So again, just something to think about. And, you know, I recommend choosing your side and putting your line on the sand, line in the sand from the beginning. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some prompts. So you can brainstorm with the group, allow 15 minutes, probably less, you probably don't need 15. But I list, a, um, list settings, so the desert, space, Italy, an island, et cetera. List characters, a pirate, a baker, a teacher, a dragon. So then you write a story about blank in or on a blank, like a teacher on a deserted island. You could write a story about a dream you had recently. You could write a story about your favorite animal or mythical creature. You could write a story about your worst day at school or maybe your best day at school. You could write a story re weaving in something interesting about your library or your town's history. 
Potona used to be located somewhere and then we moved somewhere else. And there's a very interesting story in the town where it used to be is now flooded. It's a water reservoir. So that's where this next prompt, next prompt comes from, a story about an underwater city. So you could work in something interesting like that. Or you could write a story from the point of view of a villain, which I will have bonus content on later in my presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so once you've done this exercise a bunch, my teens kind of don't get tired of it, but they want to push it further. So you could submit to a contest. My teens are very motivated by money and very motivated by contests where they win money. <laughs> so last year we um, submitted to the National Youth Foundation Student Book Scholar Contest. The theme was anti-bullying. It is still anti-bullying this year. If you win, you win $500. So what we did for this is um, everyone wrote a story from a different perspective of a bully. And all the stories wove together because it was like this family history where, um, you know, one person bullied another person and then that person bullied another person. Like, and then at the end, it was like how you can stop the chain and like stop the cycle and be the person to like finally stand up. We didn't win, but I was really, really proud of the book that we put together. We did have art in it. And um, it ended up, it was like really good, really powerful. So right now we're working on the Indie Author Project. This is a big deal. It's um, all ages. So we're competing against adults. But if we win, we win $2,500. Yes, they have, um, you know, figured out exactly how much they all get if we win. And what we're doing is that um, each person is writing from the perspective of a different mythical creature. And they're all going to be at war with each other. And in the end, they're all going to come together. There's going to be forbidden love. Um, so that's what we're doing for this project. There's also the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. That's a good one. Um, but that one passed for the year already. And I have a whole spreadsheet. So feel free to email me, knaples at katonalibrary.org. I'll try to share the link in the chat. We'll see if that works. But you can always email me and I'll share it with you. OK, next slide, please. Okay, so this is how we collaborate. We have a whiteboard that we brainstorm on. For me, I have a Google Doc or some kind of master document to take notes. So like I said, we decide on an overarching theme, we assign parts, brainstorm how we'll all come together. I like to provide mini deadlines, you know, have this done by this time and this and this. Give yourself a cushion in advance of the actual deadline. You know, I do this too. I wait till the last minute and like some people work that way and that's totally fine. So just give yourself some cushion there. So for me, the way I guide them is I'm the one taking notes. They just sit there, talk, you know, what about this? What about that? And then I ask clarifying questions. I provide guidance and structure, but I let them do the work. You know, what did you mean when you said this? Tell me more about that. You know, it's, I try to keep my opinion out of it and let them do all the work. Next slide, please. Okay, here, this is Diabolical Evil for Beginners. This is my last slide. There's my contact information. Um, this is an, a writing exercise that they loved. And you can see one of them added an eighth note. Um, I did adapt it to make it gender neutral. And it's from um, this book by Lori Lamson, by Ben Thompson. And um, yeah, that's my slide. So I have time for questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, so much stuff packed in there. And I love the scaffolding here at the end for kind of helping them you know, flesh out these characters, so to speak. Um, we do have a, a question from Mary. And Mary wonders, how did you market this? Um, how did you find teens to participate in this program? I started with only two or three. And um, I just put it in the library newsletter. I put it on our Instagram we um, have that flyer and it just, I kept up with it and it slowly built and now it's, and now it's a little bit bigger. So definitely, you know, things spread through word of mouth and um, having my colleague in the children's department, like, you know, this person would be great for it and um, just being patient and building something and knowing that they'll come eventually. 
I think that's key, right? Sometimes it doesn't start big, but it grows mm -hmm. and it grows sort of organically in different ways. And some folks in the in the uh, chat also said you could pair this with some stuff that you're already doing, like D&D. It might be a natural mm -hmm. outgrowth of a program like that, too. So great. Well, um, you're going to get Kim's slides and her contact info. So if you do have other questions, you can reach out. But thanks so much, Kim. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Next up, we have uh, a workshop that I've just I've been looking forward to just saying the name of this workshop all day. Uh, Frank and Toys workshop with Jenna Zeborowski. Um, Jenna, you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, Frank and Toys. So take it I away. Am. It's all you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this is uh, this will be the third year I do this program. If I oh no, my pretty font's gone. Oh well. Um, uh, it's a favorite among my teens, and it's become one of my favorite programs to run. Um, which helps when you're excited about the thing that you're presenting to your teens. Um, so next slide, please. Um, as you can see, everything is very Halloween themed. Um, you don't have to do this program around Halloween, um, even Halloween time of year. It kind of would work anytime. Um, I just really like Halloween. And so that's the way that I uh, theme it. An alternative that I've heard is just called Zom Barbies, um, which is a Barbie only version of this program. Um, and I have a couple of kind of examples that I'll show you later of some treasures that we have. Um, but here's the basic description. Unleash your inner mad scientist and create your very own monster. Design one of a kind creatures from repurposed toys and stuffed animals. Uh, and then we encourage the teens to bring their own if they'd like or tell them that we will provide everything that they need. Um, our teen programs are typically for 6th through 12th graders, uh, so that's what we focus on for this program as well. Um, and I've seen a couple libraries do the Zom Barbies thing with, um, like, in conjunction with the Barbie movie, um, which I'm kind of thinking about because I plan on showing that soon. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, next slide, please. So these are two examples of flyers. The one on the left is from the first year I ran the program. I kind of took a more cartoony approach. Um, and then the one on the right is from the second year I held the program and I was lucky enough to have some pictures from our first year uh, in order to include those on like social media advertising and on the poster in the library. Um, so those are two examples that you could use. I use Canva to make these, um, which makes it a lot easier. I'm sure we all do that. Um, so next slide. This program was fairly low cost, um, at least for us. We had a lot of stuff already on hand, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but our biggest expense was on the secondhand toys. I uh, went to a local thrift store and I was able to get three big, like reusable grocery bag size worth of toys for $25. Um, I explained what they were doing and they were super on board and thought it was a really great way to use up stuff that's just been sitting there. Um, so they were more than happy to work with us on that. Um, and then I purchased a classroom pack of safety glasses, which turns out to be a really, really good purchase because we've used it for other programs um, where protecting vision is important. And um, they were $25 for a 24 pack, um, and we've used them many, many times. Uh, both of these purchases have been reusable in that with the secondhand toys, even after our first workshop, there were parts and pieces left of toys to use for the following year. Um, and if I do it again this year, I'll be able to use stuff from that initial first purchase just with adding a little bit more. Uh, next slide. Here is a couple of pictures of what I was able to gather um, from a lot of the little stuff came from thrift stores. We had extra craft supplies that had been sitting around for years and I kind of just threw it all together. Um, I kind of tried to group them, if you can see in the left-hand picture, with stuffed animals in one section, dolls and Barbies in another. Um, and then I kept all of the smaller stuff kind of together so they can get a feel for what they need. Next slide. Uh, one big helpful thing that we did is we asked for donations of toys from staff members. Um, there were quite a few people that were happy to get rid of some stuff that's been hanging around their house forever. Um, so that was very helpful. These are all things we had on hand already or asked for in-house. Uh, so we have table coverings that we use for painting programs, which were useful for this. Cutting mats uh, for the blades and that kind of thing. We use scissors, glue, hot glue gun, and tape. Uh, hot glue was the most popular form of adhering things together because of the speed at which it works. Uh, permanent markers and popsicle sticks, yarn, string, embroidery floss. Basically, we just raided our craft closet and found anything that we thought could be helpful and interesting and fun to play with. Um, felts, needles and thread, pipe cleaners, feathers, googly eyes were a hit. There were many, many googly eyes attached to many things that don't usually have googly eyes, which was fun. 
Um, those acrylic gems that are really shiny and nice, buttons, pony beads, safety pins were very useful because if kids didn't want to um, get into the sewing aspect of it, but they wanted to attach different uh, materials together, that was a quick, easy fix for that. Um, and then lots of extra polyfill. We didn't end up using too much of it because when they repurposed a stuffed creature, we were able to take out all the insides from that creature and use that for other things. So we built a little pile of like pulled out stuffing that nobody's using so they could pull from there. Um, and one thing I didn't include, which I'm very glad about because um, I was iffy at first, is paint. I think it takes too long to dry and I think it can mostly be accomplished with permanent markers. We had a big container of Sharpies um, that we used in favor of paint because I don't like how long it takes to dry and it would have kept them from doing um, some extra stuff that they wanted to do. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of how I set up my supplies. Um, I tried to keep them categorically organized at least a little bit. Um, all the sharp things were together. All of the stuff you need to glue on was together. All the duct tape was together next to the glue. Um, and then there were like finishing kinds of things like the um, beads and gems and lots of yarn and everything kind of stayed in its place. They were pretty good about putting stuff back where it belonged. Um, it only became an issue when people left stuff on their tables and didn't bring it back up to the front that we like had some stuff go missing. Um, but all in all, I think it worked pretty well to keep things kind of together. Um, and then our next slide is very important um, safety tips. So these are you're kind of going to learn what works best for your library and your teens. Um, so some of these things might not apply to everybody. I found it really important to create a station for my hot glue guns so that nobody was walking around with them. Um, I like to keep them all together and on a mat where they won't burn anything on the table. They were very low temp. Uh, so I don't think that really would have been an issue anyway, but it made me feel a little bit better if all the hot stuff was in one section and I didn't have to monitor who had a hot glue gun and who didn't. I chose to only allow staff to use the blades and knives just for safety purposes. I had wanted to do this program for like six years, but the thing that kept me from doing it was the use of hot glue guns and knives. So keeping those things kind of not off limits, but in a safer way um, made me feel better about doing the program. Eye protection must be worn while using tools. I also encourage them not to use tools near their face, uh, which you do have to say out loud. Um, and most of them were good about the eye protection. We bought special glasses that can go over your seat, like eyeglasses. Um, so we didn't have that issue and they were easy to wipe down and then reuse again. Um, I emphasized using the tools properly and asking for help when needed. Uh, it was me and one library assistant of, for the first and actually both times, I believe, um, running the program. So there were people to help. Some of them had never used pliers before or didn't know what they could and couldn't cut. Uh, so that was helpful to encourage them to ask for help when they need it. And the most important thing I did, I think, is establishing safety rules at the very beginning. Um, a lot of it is common sense, but we are working with teenagers and sometimes um, we don't all have the same level of common sense. So I enjoyed being able to teach them things and also making sure that they kind of understood the severity of what we were doing because people could get hurt. Um, and they kind of, we used a um, presentation that I borrowed from another library using SID uh, the kid in Toy Story who tears all the toys apart and puts them back in weird arrangements. Um, and there's pictures of him on the slide. And so it was kind of like funny, but also I emphasize that it was kind of a serious thing. Um, we said scissors are not for prying off limbs. Uh, we don't use pliers next to our faces. If you make it kind of silly, they get it better. At least I've found. Uh, next slide. So here's a, kind of a look at um, the hot glue gun station over here on the side above the cutting mat. Uh, so all the glue guns, and you can see the teens on the bottom there, were all over there, so nobody was moving them around the room. Um, and then as well, all of the sharp instruments there. And this was where everybody went to use their tools, uh, so things were not leaving the table. These pictures are from my second year, um, and I kind of figured out a little bit better of a system that second year. Next slide. Just other quick tips, um, collect enough bodies for each team to have their own. So one doll or stuffed animal, um, plus extras because they're gonna need additional heads and limbs, which sounds very weird. <laughs> um, I created a toy graveyard. This is really important. I think this helped us a lot where when teens ripped off the arms of a Barbie, but that was all they wanted, they could put the rest of the Barbie into a toy graveyard where other kids could come and take the pieces and try to mix things together. Uh, I had a slideshow of 
images the first year for examples in case the kids didn't quite get what we were trying to accomplish um, just with other examples from other libraries that I found. And then I enjoyed um, having music in the background because the first year I did not. And it was very awkward at the beginning because nobody really knew kind of what to do. Um, and this kind of broke the ice a little bit. And then my favorite thing to do was write down funny things that the teens say as they're dismembering uh, stuffed animals and dolls. And I have a slide later that I'll show you for that. Uh, next slide. This is just an example of our toy graveyard. So you can kind of see in the middle there, the pile of legs and um, discarded limbs that other people can now use. And next slide is the funny things that the teen said. Um, it started as a joke and it ended with our library assistant recording everything funny that they said. And then by the end, they were having a competition to see who could say the weirdest stuff. So that's just some of it. My favorite is this is like free therapy. I really enjoyed that um, statement. Uh, next slide. After the program, our library assistant chose to make inspirational poster images out of their uh, quotes that they said. And so now we have some of these living um, at our desks. It's not necessary. We just found it really, really funny. And the teens liked it too. And then my last few slides are just pictures of uh, from the programs, of the toys, if you want to look at those uh, when you get the slides. These are just a few creations that we had. Um, and then I did say I have some here. This one was a Barbie creation that was gifted to me at the end of last year's program. It has three heads, many arms, two legs, um, and some mushrooms growing out of its neck. I really encourage you to take pictures. Um, this is one of my favorite programs to do because it's just so funny. Um, so yeah, make sure you take pictures um, so you can use them in the future. We had a teen offer their cosmetology experience to help with um, extensions. We also had a teen, I think it's maybe the last slide, if you can go back real quick, um, in the middle, who just happened to have their own dissection kit with them that day. Uh, so they performed a dissection on one of our Dr. Seuss stuffed animals that we were getting rid of. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, like I said, it's one of my favorite programs to run and the teens have a good time. Wow, this, yeah. Jenna, thank you. That was just oozing with creativity <laughs> and so many like little um, spinoffs from that program too. Yeah. The inspirational yeah. posters were great. Um, <laughs> and I think I saw Big Bird's head in there somewhere. You did, you sure fun. did. I think, okay. I think he was on Buzz Lightyear's body, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Great. And, you know, you kind of said a couple of things that really stuck out to me. You, um, you just like all of us, when we do something more than once, we kind of like, oh, I do it differently this way. Yeah. So kind of, I love that you shared those tips. And then the, the other thing that I think is really useful for all of us to remember is um, we have to do what feels comfortable for us. And mm -hmm. so you found a way to, to make that happen with the glue gun safety. I'm, I'm a big one on safety. So I'm, I'm in your <laughs> camp right there. So perfect. And it looks like uh, we got a couple questions. Sure. Um, how many teams do you have? And what is the um, most that you would have? I believe the first year I had maybe 11. I set the maximum for registration for 20 um, with two staff people because that felt manageable. I think we had 14 or 15 the second year. Um, so between 12 and 15 is a good, like a, a sweet spot because I didn't feel like anybody was being ignored. Um, a lot of them do ask for help with like the sewing and attaching things together. So it is a very hands-on assistance program. And so at least two staff people is is helpful. Right, right. And I think we've got some folks that are going to be trying this out in their library. And it's I fun. think adults, <laughs> I think adults would love this too. I right? think so too. So, yeah. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for sharing that sure. very creative program. Thanks. Perfect. All right. And we are going to um, wrap up our third hour with our final presentation um, from Stephanie Olson from the Schenectady County Public Library with her Taylor Swift party. So, Stephanie, it's all you. All right. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. So thanks. My name is uh, Stephanie Olson and I'm a youth services librarian at the Rotterdam and Quaker Street branches of the Schenectady County Public Library. And I'm here to show you um, about what I did during uh, the Taylor Swift program, the 1989 release party that I ran. And um, I've seen programs popping up on Facebook library program groups um, about Taylor Swift. And I thought as a fan, I'd want to take, you know, try my take on it. And uh, when Taylor actually 
re-recorded 1989, I thought that that would be the perfect opportunity to do it. So I decided to run a program at Rotterdam for teens and adults. And um, we could go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing that I kind of um, th was thinking about for the program was um, I wanted to do, well, with every era that she had, uh, I wanted to make have a craft that represented the era, but then I realized she had way too many eras, so I couldn't really um, do a craft for literally every era. So I kind of just thought of um, things that I could do that would relate to some of the you know more popular albums, including 1989. Um, and a lot of people think that you know if you have if you're doing a Taylor Swift program, you need to know more about her but I feel like you don't really because she's so popular there's a lot of research out there that you can look up and um really I think that the colors with the eras are very important to fans so if you just have basic crafts that you've done before but in different colors of the that represent the eras and that's what I showed on the um slide here then um I think that you know you probably would be okay uh, cause a lot of people say like they get nervous about it doing, you know, if they don't know about the subject, but really if you just do research and look up on Pinterest and there's a lot of crafts that are, um, relating to her eras and stuff. So, um, if you want to do the next slide, thanks. Um, so these are the supplies that I bought for crafts. Uh, we made, the, that's a coloring sheet I actually made, uh, in Canva for uh, the program. And um, so I, I bought a lot of ribbon and tool uh, pins to make uh, pins. We also have a, a button making machine that we brought uh, that we made. So we made buttons and um, we had, we made barrettes with like fake flowers and different eras colors. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures from the program because it was really popular. I had 19 teens and adults. And so it was a little crazy. Try and also I had a glue gun station as well, as Jenna was saying. So I was trying to keep track of that too. And um, I had a lot of stencils that uh, people could make their own stuff. Um, so just a lot of like craft supplies in your closet even could uh, work depending on what colors they are, of course. Um, and if you wanna go to the next slide. Okay, those are some of the pictures that I have because um, I saved those crafts actually. Uh, when I was talking about the stencils, that's what some people made. Um, I used oil pastels for the black paper and um, I have some ribbon and tool for uh, just to make like some sort of, you know, fancy frame that they could have in their room. And um, I saw the blank space activity on uh, one of the Facebook programming groups. So I thought I would do that. And a lot of people, I don't think got what it was, but I just saved it because I thought it was cool. Okay, next slide. Um, these are bookmarks I made in Canva and they're, uh, you can color them too. And they seem to really like that. I printed it on cardstock and uh, I, you know, I, those are all Taylor Swift lyrics. Um, the one with the house with the different colors uh, represent her eras, her albums, I should say. That's like every era is an album. So, um, and I thought it would just be cool. Like, I feel like Taylor Swift fans really like, um, you know, hidden messages or like secret things that only Taylor Swift fans know. So I thought I would do some funny uh, lyric bookmarks that people would like. Um, next slide. Oh, that is a, so this is a, another game that I made. It's um, basically, can you name this Taylor Swift, Swift song? Um, and then, so I printed it out. And then on the other side of the piece of paper was the song title and people, it was kind of like a passive idea where people could just like go on the, you know, at the table and just like play the game as they were going along with the, you know, making other crafts. So I just wanted to see in the chat if anyone knows this song title. <laughs> uh, 
just for just just out of curiosity. Yep, you're on your own, kid. I just I and I also had fun with it too because it was just funny to you know think of like things that you could do that were um going to be relating to the song titles. And then the next slide. Okay, this one was one of my favorite ones because I just thought it was funny. If anyone knows. And also, I did use reputation uh, font. That's another thing that's really popular with Taylor Swift fans is every era or album um, means, you know, that there's also a different font related to it. So, yes, I can share the fonts that I used. Delicate. Yes. And then the next slide. Oh, yeah, this one's funny, too. Um, if anyone has an idea of what it is. Um, yeah, Gold Rush. So good. There's some Taylor Swift fans here. Um, yeah, and that's my, actually, that's my Canva project, the QR code. Um, and uh, if anyone has trouble accessing it, you could always email me or call me at the Rotterdam branch. I'm usually there most of the time. Today's my only day at the Quaker Street branch Wednesdays. So, um, and I know that maybe I went a little fast because I wanted it to be eight minutes. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, I guess, I, I know, I'm sorry, I didn't specify what an era meant and I probably should have done that in the beginning. Uh, yeah, that means, so she's going on this thing called the Eras Tour and she's celebrating all of her albums that are, um, as she says, every album is equal to an era and a different color. Right. Oh, um, I see the question, can this be done with other artists? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a great question because you, this has so many possibilities, right? So obviously Taylor Swift is huge right now, um, but all kinds of uh, artists that you could tap into, right? Musical, um, other other ways. So perfect. Yeah. And I love that you said that you don't have to know everything about Taylor Swift because there's so much information out there. So even if you feel like, oh, I don't know if I could do this, probably folks right. could. So. Yeah. And usually if you have the colors for the different eras, I feel like, you know, you could just make very basic crafts that you make in other programs and and then make it a, um, you know, an eras craft. So. so very easily to kind of adapt it to what you need. Perfect. Great. April yeah. 19th. We, we see this is what happens when you work with librarians. They find stuff so quickly. When is the next album coming out and about? Oh, yeah. I was going to so. say, yeah, you could do a party if you wanted um, for the Tortured Poets Department, which is coming out April 19th. It's our new era, I guess. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect timing. So thank you yeah. so much, Stephanie. And we have all your contact information in slides. So folks will be getting that and maybe reaching out to you for some ideas. So perfect. Oh, cop we have a copyright question. And that yeah. is, yeah. Did you want to handle that or you want? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I guess the answer would be, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I did play 1989 um, for the party and so we listen to music and stuff um but as far as copyright goes i don't think that uh because that because i used a lot of my own creations in canva i don't think that there would be a problem but i think it's maybe yeah. fair use on some level yeah. um playing the music you probably need that ask cap li uh license for your library um and we've got some people in the in the chat checking in too so um, only if you're selling it. So yeah, copyright is one of those interesting things. And there's there's never like a clear answer. It's never black and white. There's a lot of other questions that have to answer around that fair use issue. So, but good things to be thinking about because we all know Disney is a, a company that does pay attention to that. So um, right. and it is someone's intellectual property. So we want to respect that. So perfect. But thank you so much for sharing yeah. the idea. Very adaptable. No problem. Great. Yeah. Perfect. And that kind of does it for me and my hour. I'm going to send it over to my colleague, Renee. She's going to kind of send us out today. So Renee, it's all you. Thanks, Heidi. Um, hi, everybody. So on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to all our presenters for sharing your amazing ideas with all of us today. We know this takes time and we are incredibly grateful for everything you've created for us and shared with us today. We would love it if you all could share your thoughts on today's collaboration 
by filling out our evaluation. I'm not sure if it's going in the, um, yep, I think it's going in the chat. Um, the link is in the chat and it'll be going out to each of you from your system rep also. We look at that carefully and we take your suggestions and your opinions to uh, very seriously and we, we you know, tweak things uh, accordingly. So within the coming week or so, your system rep will also send your CEUs and a link to the Google Drive that will have all of the slides and the recording of today. Jack Scott, our friendly shark today um, from SALS will be time stamping the recording so you can easily find the part of the workshop you're looking for. And as a reminder, everyone's contact is on the agenda that went out for today. If you don't have the agenda, it will also be in the group. So no matter where you are in your summer reading program journey, we hope we've inspired you today to begin an adventure with your community and your patrons to make this summer better than ever.